So, a uh, very, very good morning to all the people who have come here on a very cold Sunday morning. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Surgical Oncology and uh, the Departments of ENT at uh, AIG Hospitals, um, I gratefully and cordially thank you all for coming. So, this is uh, going to be the first of many workshops uh, that uh, we at the Department of uh, Oncology want to conduct. And uh, I felt that this being a relevant uh, topic for most uh, practicing ENT surgeons, BDS surgeons, as well as general surgeons, we thought that we will start off with something which is uh, quite basic from the surgical oncology point of view. But uh, I think it's very, very relevant for uh, people who are in the field. So uh, first of all, we have a very, very uh, eminent faculty panel here today. Uh, we have Dr. K. V. V. N. Rajugaru, who has been, I think, in the surgical oncology community in his no production. Uh, he is the senior surgical oncologist at uh, Basavatarakam Indo-American Cancer Hospitals uh, at Banjara Hills, and he has been a mentor and uh, a coach, can I say, to a whole host of uh, surgical oncologists who have been spread across the city and also across the country. So I kindly invite Dr. Raju sir to please uh, take the chairs on the stage. A warm round of applause, please. Yeah. So next we have uh, Dr. Uh, Arvind Kapali. Ar Dr. Arvind Kapali is uh, a close friend of mine. He's been uh, my senior uh, from my days at uh, Regional Cancer Center, Trivandrum, my alma mater. Uh, he is uh, right now uh, the Associate Professor at the Department of Surgical Oncology, uh, MS Ramaya Medical College, Bangalore. And uh, he also heads a good training program with, I think, an intake of uh, about uh, two to three uh, surgical oncology PGs every year. And I kindly invite Dr. Arvind sir to take the dais. Thank you. There was a third uh, panelist, Dr. Umakan sir. Um, actually, unfortunately, Dr. Umakan sir has been busy with a kind of uh, a family emergency. But he said he will definitely uh, make time to come during the afternoon. Dr. Omar Kansar is a professor and the unit chief of the third unit at uh, the Regional Cancer Center at uh, Lakhati Kapul MNJ Cancer Hospital. And as soon as he comes, we will be inviting him on stage. And lastly, I invite Dr. Uh, Jay Karthik. Dr. Jay Karthik has been uh, one of my closest friends uh, during my tenure at uh, Basatarakam Indo-American Cancer Hospital and is right now uh, a practicing surgical oncologist at Mysore, uh, Karnataka. Please, Dr. Karthik, on stage. So we actually, in the brochure, uh, it was uh, mentioned that we had uh, three types of cases. That is, uh, one was a parotidectomy, uh, the second was um, a thyroidectomy, and the third would be a parathyroid case. Uh, but right now, as you know, most conferences and especially live workshops, uh, they are subject to last minute changes. So the parotidectomy is not going to be there. Instead, we will be uh, focusing on three thyroidectomies, uh, including uh, one which is a multinodular goiter, one which would be a soliton nodule, and the third we will be actually presenting as though it is a, a parathyroid case because I think. Uh, most of the eminent panel members will also agree with me that in terms of the surgery for a parathyroid, it is almost the same uh, as a surgery for a thyroid cancer because the steps and the localization is the same. But regarding uh, the management and the post-operative care, pre-operative care, we will be having a couple of talks uh, which will be, I think, very, very informative to the audience. So right now, I would like to hand it over to the OT staff. I hope uh, I am audible. Dr. Varun, am I... Am I audible, Dr. Varun? Yes, you are audible, Dr. Yeah, so Dr. Varun is uh, my colleague. He has joined uh, our department uh, and it's been almost a year. He has done his uh, training from uh, the prestigious uh, Tata Memorial Cancer Hospital at uh, Bombay. And uh, he will be telling you about the details of the first case. Over to you, Varun. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sridhar. Uh, I welcome all the delegates, especially Raj. Varun can be a bit louder, I think. It has to be increasing the volume a bit. Can you hear me now? Yeah, no, now it's better. Now it's better. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Sridhar. And I also thank all the delegates for being here in the morning. Dr. Raju, sir, Dr. Arvind, and Dr. So, uh, 
so the first case will actually be a hemithyroidectomy so i have a short case prepared for that we'll go through that case capsule first so this is a 56 year old female who complained of a swelling in front of her neck and mild discomfort while swallowing she was evaluated with an endoscopy which was normal and then she got an ultrasound outside this ultrasound picked up a nodule in the right side of the thyroid lobe which is about 1.6 into 1.5 centimeters in the right side of the thyroid with few cystic components and multiple fo foci of calcifications so the radiologist gave us a thyroid scoring of 4 so based on the size criteria and the thyroid score so this warranted an FNAC for this lesion and the FNAC was Bethesda 4 she had a normal TFT and a thyroid profile both her vocal cords on examination were normal so she is planned for a right hemithyroidectomy and a general anesthesia today so before we get so over to you dr Sridhar. yeah so i think uh, this uh, the brief case capsule is it's she is a uh, an elderly lady about 56 year old who presented with a, actually a non palpable lesion uh, the page lesion itself was not palpable but on uh, evaluation she has found uh, to have a nodule which is less than about 4 cm 1.5 into 1.6 cm which is a Bethesda 4 so before we go into the actual nitty gritties of the surgery uh, and for the benefit of the audience we will actually be talking about how do we evaluate a thyroid nodule in terms of two important investigative modalities the first investigative modality is imaging and by that imaging we know because it's the most common imaging modality and that is the ultrasound of the neck that is going to be told by Dr. Varun. Following this, there will be um, the second part that is the, the pathological evaluation of these thyroid nodules that is uh, by the FNAC, which is going to be told by our pathologist Dr. Khushbu. So, over to you, Varun. Uh, I think you can go ahead with your presentation on the ultrasound. So I think while they are getting ready, um, I just want a small show of hands. How many of the people in the audience are actually ENT surgeons? Can you just raise your hands once? Okay. And how many of you all are general surgeons? Okay, quite a good number. And uh, I think a lot of people from the dental sciences also. Can you just raise your hands? Okay, so we have a good uh, smattering of uh, people from different specialities. And uh, how often do you see uh, thyroid nodules in your clinical practice? by a scale of say about one a month or two a month or is it more than say about five or six in a month general roll call maybe about four three or four in a month okay yeah so Varun uh, are you ready up there or yeah, we are ready here yeah thank you you can go ahead yeah. so before we get the OT just started with painting and draping I just want to give a brief overview on how we uh, evaluate thyroid nodules especially giving a focus on what this thy thyroid scoring actually means and how the radiology report am i audible to that? yeah you can be a bit more louder Varun. i think that that has to be a little bit in the increase in the volume uh, from the audio visual side okay so these are the basic tests that we do when the patient comes with a thyroid nodule so we evaluate the biochemical parameters like thyroid function tests, especially the serum TSH and we get an ultrasound of the thyroid, ultrasound of the neck and then we go ahead with an FNAC. So thyroid function tests you all know essentially tells us if the patient is euthyroid status, hyperthyroid or hypothyroid. The only caveat to remember here is if the TSH is low, that is the patient is a hyperthyroid patient. In that case, we consider a thyroid scintigraphy. In most cases, what we see in the clinic, most of these patients are either hypothyroid or they are euthyroid. And if they come with a lump in front of the neck or the complaint of a swelling, we directly go ahead with a USG of the thyroid. So, and the guidelines which most institutes today follow are the ATA guidelines. Uh, this were given by the American Thyroid Association. The latest guidelines are from 2015. And this probably has the best evidence to actually what to do when you come across a thyroid nodule. A recent finding, especially in most onco centers, is a pet incidentaloma. 
so we get PET CT for a lot of indications, especially for cancers, and suddenly you see a thyroid nodule uh, popping up or lighting up. So what do we do with this? So again, this again is evaluated like uh, the same guidelines given by the ATA. Uh, and if they are less than one centimeter, we actually try and follow them up and more than one centimeter, we evaluate them with an FNS. So coming to the sonography, so what is the exact reason why we do sonography in these patients is that we want to identify those small subset of patients who might actually be having a thyroid cancer and try and avoid unnecessary over investigation and biopsies, etc. in other kinds of patients where majority could be benign nodules. So that guides our management also. So these are the parameters grossly that the sonologist looks at. They look at the margins, echogenicity, the shape, the cystic nature or solid nature. And they also do a Doppler to see the vascular status of this. So previously there used to be a lot of confusion in reporting. There used to be a lot of jargon used by different radiologists. There is no consistency in all this. So over time we realize that there has to be a standardized system for reporting of these ultrasounds and that was the birth of the Tyrads scoring system. So this is by, by the American College of Radiology and they released a white paper in 2017 uh, which has still not been updated and uh, that is what we follow. So the crux of the matter is that there are five categories in ultrasonographic evaluation that we look at. Number one is composition, number two echogenicity, then the shape, then margin and then echogenic foci. These five categories are the ones we look for and each one has subcategories in them. So each category is given a score 0 to 3 and we add up all these scores and once we add up we get a uh, final score of thyroids 1 to 5. So please note that the size is not one of the categories that we look for in actually categorizing into a tyroid scoring and I'll tell you why. So basically tyroid scoring will give you the risk of malignancy for this patient based on these five parameters but then a size comes into picture only once the tyroid classification you already have got the tyroid classification. I'll give you an example and that will be more clear. So these are the five features that we look at. Composition, echogenicity, shape, margin and echogenic foci. So in composition, you have either a cystic or a spongy form lesion which gets a score of 0 and if the composition is totally solid, it gets a score of 2 and if it's somewhere in between solid cystic, you get a score of 1. So these are this is a mixed solid cystic lesion and on the lower right, you have a completely solid lesion. So that is the first category. So you have to do the composition of this patient. One caveat to remember is if a sonologist finds a completely cystic lesion or a completely spongy form lesion, the rest of the categories are not measured. So basically that becomes zero and uh, it's a tyroid one. Okay, that is benign. The second parameter that you look at is the echogenicity. So you want to see if it is hyperechoic, hypoechoic, or there is also a category called as very hypoechoic. So depending on that, you give a score. So echogenicity is usually measured with the adjacent thyroid. So if it is uh, the echogenicity is the same, it say it is said as anechoic. If it is hyperechoic, that means it is lighting up more than the surrounding thyroid gland. It's a score of one. Hypoechoic is more ominous for malignancy. That gets a score of two. And there is also a category of very hypoechoic, where we check it with the surrounding strap muscles and that appears more darker. So here, this is a very hyper lesion which got a score of 2. So here is the strap muscle shown in yellow arrows and then this is the thyroid node. And then the third category they look at is the shape. Uh, there are only two subcategories in this. A taller than wide means more sensitive malignancy and a score of 3. If that is not, you get a score of 0. And then the margin, a smooth margin or a lean defined margin is score of 0 and anything irregular or with extra thyroidal spread is a higher score. And the last category and this is a different category because any of these subcategories can be added up to get the final score. Like for example, the patient can have macro calcification and still have punctate echogenic foci. So you add up these scores. This is not the case with other subcategories where you have to uh, determine if it is 
solid or solid cystic or any of that. So you cannot have multiple things in the same subcategory. So uh, from this talk, this is probably the only slide which gives uh, the entire gist of what we are talking about. There are five subcategories, composition, echogenicity, shape, margin and echogenic foci. There is no mention of size in this to get the tyroids level. So once the scoring is done by the sonologist, you give a final tyroid scoring of 1 to 5. So ranging from benign, so tyroid 1 and 2 is benign, tyroid 3, 4 and 5 have an increasing risk of malignancy. So fine, we have in the USG report, the sonologist has said a tyroid scoring of 4 or 3. So what does it mean? So it means that it gives you the threshold of size beyond which you need to FNAC this patient. That is what a thyroid, sc a thyroid scoring actually gives. So as you can see the recommendation for thyroid 1 and 2, you don't have to FNAC regardless of the size. So even if you have a 3 centimeter completely cystic lesion, which is a thyroid 1, you don't have to FNAC, FNAC this patient. Beyond that, thyroids 3, 4 and 5, they have a threshold of size. So thyroids 3 has a threshold of 2.5 centimeters. So that is any lesion with thyroids 3 more than 2.5, you have to FNAC this. Same with thyroids 4 where the threshold is 1.5. And for tyroids 5, the threshold is 1. So what are the take-home points from this? So are there lesions which can be left alone regardless of the size based on the tyroid scoring? Yes, that is tyroids 1 and tyroids 2. You can leave them alone. Don't do any, any FNAC. For all other lesions, is there a size criteria we have to consider for FNAC? Yes, for tyroids 3, it is 2.5. Then it is 1.5 for tyroids 4 and 1 centimeters for tyroid 5. So what does this mean at the end? So it means regardless of the tyroid score, if a lesion is less than 1 centimeter, you don't have to FNAC these lesions. And that is what the HCA guidelines tell you. So less than 1 centimeter, even if it is tyroid 5, you don't have to FNAC them. But regardless, you have to follow them. So there is a follow-up protocol also for each of these. So for tyroid 3, if it's less than 2.5 centimeters, you follow them up every alternate year. For tyroid 4 and 5, you follow them up every year. So this is the risk of malignancy. Different studies have different numbers in this and this was from the original 2017 white paper that uh, the tyroid scoring was based on. So the risk of malignancy for a tyroid 5 is 35%, for tyroid 4 it is 9%. So in conclusion, in fact, uh, uh, the job of the sonologist or probably the clinician has been made very easy with the tyroid scoring because it gives you specific guidelines as to what to do next. Uh, which is whether to FNAC the patient or not. So, by the way, once we get the OT ready and uh, we start the case, there will be another presentation on the scoring, Bethesda scoring for FNAC and how that affects the management. I hope this has clarified a few things about tyroid scoring. Thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. Sridhar. So, thank you, Varun, uh, for that excellent uh, presentation about uh, the impact and the importance of uh, a tyroid scoring system. I think the take home point that should be known is that. Uh, Any time if you see a thyroid nodule uh, and you send it for a, uh, an ultrasound and the sonologist is not giving you a thyroid scoring actually, so it, it, it becomes, uh, it is mandatory for the clinician to actually ask for them to give a thyroid score. This is uh, specifically it been developed so that inter observable, observable uh, variability is uh, reduced. And that is the reason that we have come up with so many scoring systems, not only for thyroid, for thyroid, but also for breast, for liver, uh, for brain lesions. So the American College of Radiology has made this so as to standardize the reporting so that wherever the patient goes, as soon as they see the thyroid scoring, you can automatically stratify the patient into a low risk or a high risk and then follow the patient up accordingly. So I think uh, this is only part of the story. The second part of the story obviously is the pathologist's job to actually guide us in uh, what we are going to do with the patient, whether to actually go for a surgery or whether we can keep the patient on follow-up. And uh, regarding that, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Khushbu, who is our uh, uh, pathologist, to come on stage and give us her uh, talk on the Bethesda scoring system in a thyroid. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Khushbu.
Good morning. I'm going to talk about the Bethesda system for reporting of thyroid cytology and its correlation with the Tirard system. The role of FNA is to differentiate between the benign and malignant lesions and to triage patients who require surgery. The Bethesda system provides a standard nomenclature for reporting of thyroid FNA and also enables better communication between the clinicians and pathologists. It has six diagnostic categories, each with a predefined risk for malignancy and a usual management strategy. The first category is the non-diagnostic or unsatisfactory uh, category which fails to meet the adequacy criteria. By adequacy criteria, I mean that there must be at least six groups of well-visualized thyroid follicular epithelial cells that are well-stained, undistorted and unobstructed. And each group is supposed to have at least 10 cells, preferably on a single slide. So examples that may fall in this criteria are Sister. one that fails to meet the... Ah, she cannot stand here. Kada. No head end ball. Head end coaches. Better. It will not It will not It will Yeah, Dr. Varun. Can you hear me? Varun? Yes, can you? No, no, your audio is visible right now. She is presenting. Kindly ask him to turn off the audio. Thank you. The examples that fall in the first category are the one fail to meet the adequacy criteria or when the aspirate is cyst fluid alone that may or may not show histiocytes but there are no thyroid follicular epithelial cells. Here we can see the hemorrhage obstructing the thyroid follicular epithelial cells. There are no thyroid follicular epithelial cells in this picture and these are only cyst macrophages in the cyst fluid. There is no presence of thyroid follicular epithelial cells. Needle tract contaminant epithelial cells from the trachea, skeletal muscle fragments, but no thyroid follicular epithelial cells and air drying artifact that is obscuring the morphology of thyroid follicular cells. The category 2 is benign thyroid lesions, which is the most common interpretation in FNAs, approximately 65% of the cases. These lesions include benign follicular nodules, thyroiditis and some other rare entities. A benign follicular nodule encompasses adenomatoid nodule, nodular goiter and colloid nodule. The characteristic of these lesions is abundant colloid and benign appearing follicular cells in varying proportions, admixed with oncocytic cells and macrophages sometimes. Grossly, we aspirate colloid which is viscous, shiny, light yellow to golden in color. The smears are sparse to moderately cellular and the colloid in the background appears on Romanowski stain blue to magenta and on pap stain green to orange. Here we can see thin colloid which is appearing like a membrane, like, like a cellophane coating and this is also thin colloid. Sometimes it may form folds appearing, appearing like a mosaic chicken wire pattern. This is thick colloid which appears like a cracking glass and the cells are arranged in 3D clusters or monolayered sheets having a honeycomb pattern. In the background we see bare nuclei which must not be mistaken for lymphocytes which might mislead the diagnosis of thyroiditis. Sometimes there may be a cystic degeneration and the background may show colloid laden macrophages or cyst macrophages. Talking about thyroiditis, Hashimoto's or lymphocytic thyroiditis is the most common variety of thyroiditis that is characterized by polymorphic population of lymphoid cells admixed with Herthel cells. Herthel cells are thyroid follicular cells that become reactive and show abundant granular eosinophilic cytoplasm, enlarged nuclei and sometimes prominent nucleoli. There is impinging of the lymphocytes on the thyroid follicular epithelial cells and they are also scattered in the background. The smears are usually hypercellular but sometimes in the later stages when there is fibrosis or hemodilution the cellularity may appear decreased. Sometimes the inflammation predominates so much that thyroid follicular cells might not be seen in the aspirate. In such cases there is no adequacy criteria for the smear like we may, we may not require 6 clusters of thyroid follicular cells for this. Even in the predominance of inflammation we can call it as adequate and give the diagnosis of a thyroiditis. Other variants of thyroiditis are granulomatous thyroiditis, also known as subacute or dequerence, characterized by epithelioid granulomas. There are other stages, early, later and involutional. The characteristic is the finding of an epithelioid granuloma in the smear with scattered thyroid follicular cells. Also, there may be seen macrophages that engulf the colloid. Acute thyroiditis is a rare infectious condition of the thyroid, usually seen in immunocompromised patients, characterized by an acute inflammatory cell infiltrate in the background. The cells are scanty. Sometimes a bacteria or fungus can also be seen in the background. 
Redel thyroiditis is a rarest form of thyroiditis characterized by progressive fibrosis and destruction of the gland where the cells are very scanty and all we get to see is occasional scattered spindle cells or collagen bands. The thyroid follicular cells and inflammation are scant. A rare Graves disease is autoimmune diffuse hyperplastic disorder of the thyroid seen in middle-aged women clinically presenting like hyperthyroidism and diffuse enlargement of the gland. It usually does not require FNA for the diagnosis but sometimes because of the large lesion there may be a suspicion for malignancy and prompt an FNA. The smears show hypersecretory changes of the thyroid follicular epithelial cells that is herthal cell change which I have already described. Sometimes hypervacuation of the cells as we can see in this image and granular eosinophilic cytoplasm with frayed margins which may appear like flame cells. Mild anisonucleosis may be seen. The third category is atypia of undetermined significance or follicular lesion of undetermined significance where the epithelial cells may show cytological atypia or architectural atypia or both which are not sufficient enough for it to fall under any other category. Atypical lymphoid infiltrate or a prominent population of micro follicles which are not quantitatively sufficient to fall into category 5 or 6 also fall under this third category. Sometimes atypia may be seen because of smear preparation artifacts also like air drying artifact or clotting artifact what we can see here. This is enlargement of nuclei because of air drying and this is the clotting artifact which gives a false appearing appearance of overlapping of cells. An expert pathologist by their experience can easily distinguish between true atypia and artifactual atypia. Other examples of uh, cases that fall under this category 3 are an exclusive population of herthal cells. These might be seen in multinodular goiter or Hashimoto's thyroiditis or a herthal cell nodule. Like here we see herthal cell population which have abundant granular cytoplasm and mild overlapping. Sometimes focal papillary carcinoma like nuclear features may be seen or cyst lining cells may appear atypical because of reactive changes. These also fall under the category 3. Also patients undergoing treatment with methimazole or ionizing radiation may show markedly enlarged nuclei and prominence of nucleoli atypical features which fall under this and as I have already said atypical lymphoid infiltrate quantitatively falling short of category 5 or 6. Other few examples showing nuclear clearing focal papillary like nuclear features overlapping of cells marked nuclear enlargement prominence of micro follicular pattern again overlapping of the cells. The category 4 is follicular neoplasm or suspicious for follicular neoplasm. Follicular lesions encompass nodular goiter or hyperplasia, follicular adenoma, carcinoma, follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma and non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasm with papillary like nuclear features. All these lesions show an overlapping of cyto cytomorphological features. Hence, they cannot be distinguished accurately by FNA alone. The definitive diagnosis can be given only by histopathology after looking for the architecture, capsular and vascular invasion. However, whenever an FNA is done, the smears are moderate to markedly cellular and there is an alteration in the normal follicular architecture, meaning as compared to the benign lesions, the follicles here may show cellular predominance of micro follicular pattern and single cells. The cells may be normal or enlarged, but the NC ratio remains intact. The nucleus and cytoplasm both are increased in size. Sometimes there may be mild nuclear atypia and hyperchromatic nuclei. Colloid is scant. Here we see scant colloid entrapped in the follicle and overlapping of the follicles, predominance of micro follicular pattern. Here also there is a marked overlapping of the cells. The nuclei are mildly enlarged here. There is an entity called follicular neoplasm herthal cell type or suspicious for follicular neoplasm herthal cell type where there is an exclusive population of herthal cells which may be seen in groups or scattered singly. As I have already said herthal cell change is a reactive hypersecretory change of the thyroid follicular epithelial cells which have abundant granular eosinophilic cytoplasm mild anisonucleosis may also be seen. Herthal cells are not only seen in Herthal cell nodule but also in multinodular goiter and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So how do you differentiate this entity from the other two? Absence of lymphocytes and absence of colloid prompts a diagnosis towards Herthal cell nodule. 
category 5 is suspicious for malignancy which is a heterogeneous category that includes various types of malignancies where the morphological changes are such that it is just short of a malignancy quantitatively but we cannot ignore and we have to put it under a suspicious category. The target positive predictive value for this category is 55 to 85 percent. In our institute so far we have had a uh, PPV of 100 percent for this category. The first entity that falls under this category is suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma. I would like to describe the features of papillary thyroid carcinoma before going into the details. The cells in papillary thyroid carcinoma are characteristically arranged in a papillary pattern and there is a characteristic nuclear features that is the nuclear enlarged pleomorphic with a Ground, uh, with a ground glass clearing, the powdery chromatin, multiple micronuclei, longitudinal nuclear grooves, irregular nuclear membranes. These are the characteristic nuclear features, also called as orphan any eye nuclei. These features are required to give a diagnosis of papillary thyroid carcinoma. So, when I say suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma, there is something falling short of the definitive carcinoma diagnosis. There are four patterns here. Pattern A, where there is a patchy nuclear changes pattern. All cells do not show, but patchy cells show the features of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Other is incomplete nuclear changes pattern, where some nuclear changes are seen, but all changes might not be seen. Sparsely cellular and cystic degeneration pattern, where the cells are vacuolated and background shows cyst macrophages. There is another entity suspicious for medullary carcinoma where there is a monomorphic population of uh, non-cohesive small to medium sized cells and the uh, cells have a plasma cytoid appearance with eccentric nuclei. Also the background might show amorphous eosinophilic material that could be amyloid. Suspicious of lymphoma shows atypical lymphoid infiltrate. The two categories, medullary carcinoma and lymphoma, they are differentials of each other. So, when there is a definite confusion between the two, we can simply give it a suspicious for malignancy not otherwise specified and that would prompt the surgeon to take the necessary surgical action according to the risk management strategy provided by the Bethesda system. The final category is the malignancy which has various entities. The first uh, carcinoma I want to talk about is papillary thyroid carcinoma and its variants. I have already said the cells are arranged in papillary pattern or syncytial group swirling pattern may be seen. Here we see a beautiful intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusion, multiple micronuclei, enlarged nuclei, longitudinal nuclear grooves, overlapping of cells and calcification that is samoma bodies, concentric calcified rings. The colloid if present it is thick chewing gum like. Other variants of papillary thyroid carcinoma which a pathologist must be aware before signing of the final report is a follicular variant, macro follicular variant, cystic variant, oncocytic variant. The nuclear features remain the same but the pattern is not only papillary but other patterns are also seen. There is a columnar cell variant, tall cell variant and hyalinizing trabecular tumor. Medullary thyroid carcinoma is derived from the parafollicular C cells of the thyroid gland. Here the cells are isolated, singly scattered or sometimes in groups and they have a plasma cytoid appearance with an eccentric nucleus. Sometimes there may be spindle cells or polygonal cells as well and the chromatin is neuroendocrine because of the uh, parafollicular origin. So, whenever there is a cell block provided, we can do immunohistochemistry and it is positive for synaptophysin and chromogranin which are neuroendocrine markers. Also, there is presence of am amyloid which is dense amorphous. It may be mistaken for colloid but on polarizer microscopy, we can see this apple green birefringence. So, because uh, it is parafollicular C cells, calcitonin is also positive, TTF1 is positive, thyroglobulin is negative. So, a cell block for every case where there is a suspicion for malignancy is recommended so that ancillary studies like IHC and polarizer microscopy can be performed. Poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma shows cells arranged in nests or insular groups with high grade features like mitosis, necrosis and uh, high grade nuclear atypia and these insular sheets are surrounded by a fibrovascular core. 
it is important for a pathologist to categorize these lesions into their specific types because the treatment varies some of the cases like poorly differentiated or anaplastic thyroid carcinoma may require pre op or post op radio chemotherapy or with radio iodine therapy undifferentiated anaplastic carcinoma is another rare but aggressive entity that is characterized by spindle cells or epithelioid rhabdoid plasmacytoid cells arranged in sheets it is very aggressive but the incidence is less than 5% high grade nuclear features like marked nuclear enlargement mitosis multinucleation inflammatory cell infiltrate comprising of neutrophils impinging the cells and osteoclast like giant cells are also seen other rare tumors of the thyroid are mites from distant organs like lung breast skin colon kidney or from the adjacent organs lymphomas which may be primary or secondary mostly b cell type these seen, these are seen arising within the hashimotos thyroiditis and exclusive squamous cell carcinoma of the thyroid may also be seen but are rare so the tirads and bethesda usually show a good substantial concordance especially between the low risk and high risk categories that is tirads 2 bethesda 2 and tirads 4 bethesda 4 or 5 sometimes there may be discordance and the reasons for discordance include error in sampling or the nature of the lesion for example when an fna is done from the cystic hemorrhagic or degenerative changes in the tumor like in papillary thyroid tumor the neoplastic cells may be few in the smear which might lead to false negative interpretation or in a papillary microcarcinoma which is less than 1 cm si size it may be missed on the fna because of its small size false positives may be seen when the nuclear features of ptc are seen in some benign conditions like hashimotos or adenomatoid nodule or papillary hyperplasia in a benign nodule also the follicular pattern lesions which i have already said have overlapping nuclear features and uh, and a definitive diagnosis is provided only on histopathology may be showing some discordance with the tirad score Uh, there was a study conducted by gayatri et al in chennai and in the diagnosis of malignancy it showed that fna and tirads showed almost similar sensitivity specificity and accuracy so to conclude i would like to say that fna is a good screening tool and bethesda system should be followed to minimize false positives and negatives and to provide a definite management plan because the studies have shown good concordance between tirads and bethesda category 2 fna can be deferred in tirads 2 cases however a benign fna should be followed up with excision in case there is a discordance between the imaging and pathological findings particularly in extreme categories like tirads 5 bethesda 2 or tirads 2 bethesda 5 histopathology remains the gold standard method of diagnosis also a cell block must be provided whenever possible to perform ancillary studies Thank you. So I think uh, an excellent uh, and very detailed talk uh, given by uh, Dr. Khushbu. So I think the take-home message. Uh, I think she had one slide which was mentioned that uh, the Bethesda one basically means it's an unsatisfactory um, FNAC and therefore it has to be repeated. Bethesda two is benign and three onwards they require some form of uh, evaluation. Uh, three, you can actually keep the patient on follow-up, and four and five generally go for uh, surgery. So for our particular patient, uh, it was a Bethesda thyroid four with a Bethesda four. So we have going forward with a hemithyroidectomy. Uh, my one question to the panel members would be: um, So is there any condition um, in which you would not go for a, for example, what she has told is fine needle aspiration cytology? Is there a condition maybe where you would not go for a? an aspiration cytology the so called fnn uh, c that is a fine needle non aspiration cytology uh, dr arvin mm -hmm. is there any condition you would not do an aspiration but just do um, no negative aspiration you would only do a fine needle non aspiration cytology especially when you are uh, a patient with the strider Okay. Push for a uh, non-aspiration because uh, poorly different. Actually, the cell, uh, the non-aspiration cell amount will be quite. Low. Yeah. So, yeah. I think that is one way. But uh, I think the uh, a better common condition which we see is if a patient is hyperthyroid, 
and there is extreme high amount of vascularity which is seen on the ultrasound, then what happens is there is high chance that you are going to get hemorrhagic aspirate, there is a bleeding risk. So that is when actually the guidelines say that you don't go for an aspiration, you just go for a non-aspiration cytology. You poke with your uh, needle, that is a 21 gauge needle, and whatever cells come within the core of the particular needle itself is going to be enough for you. Aspirate. When you start aspirating, more likely you are going to hit some blood vessel and you will get hemorrhagic aspirate. I think that is something, the reason also uh, why an ultrasound is important, especially when we are comment about the increase in the vascularity and the peripheral vascularity, that should be a uh, guide to the pathologist when they are doing a, a, an aspiration cycle. But when you get a hemorrhagic aspirate, it could be because of this. So I think the OT, uh, everybody seems to be ready. Uh, Dr. Varun, uh, are you uh, all, all set up there? Yeah, the OT is set up. Am I audible? Yeah, you are, you are very much audible. I think you can uh, start with the uh, live feed. I am handing it over to you. Thank you, Varun. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Sridhar. So, our patient has already been intubated. You can show it. And positioned. So, we have our team here. Dr. Sunil Pandian, sir, who is the HOD of anesthesia, along with Dr. Sai, who is a consultant in anesthesia. We also have Dr. Nagarjuna, who is the first assistant, our brother Gokarna and Hema sister who will be assisting me today for the case. So, brief, a few lines about the positioning. So, this patient has a sandbag placed beneath the shoulder and the head ring. So, there is a, so that it can give good extension at the neck. We have also given a slight head up position of around 20 to 30 degrees, just to decrease the congestion in the neck. I have also marked a few landmarks over here. So, this is the midline, this is the hyoid, this is the midline. These are the two clavicles and here I have marked the sternocleidomastoid so that I know the limit of my incision. So, I would also like uh, Dr. Sunil sir to just say a few words about the anesthesia aspects of thyroid surgery. Yeah, good morning all. Uh, thank you very much Dr. Sridhar and team for uh, giving us this opportunity. Well, if you see, uh, thyroid case is a challenge for uh, not only the surgeons, uh, but for also for the anesthesiologist. And important thing that we have to remember when we are doing thyroidectomy uh, patients is uh, the type of surgery, whether it's a hemithyroidectomy or a total thyroidectomy or a radical thyroidectomy. Uh, good, because, uh, good morning, uh, Sunil. Uh, good morning. The voice is not clear. I think you remove your mask. Am I, am I audible now? Yeah, now it's much better. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Good Thank morning, you. Sunil. Yeah. Dr. Raju here. Yes, sir. Good, good morning, sir. So, basically, thyroidectomy is a challenge. Uh, uh, it gives us challenges in many ways. Uh, importantly from us, the airway is one of the things that we always have to be careful. So, whenever we are doing PSAs, we have to make sure that the patient doesn't have any compressive symptoms like hoarseness of voice or dysphagia. And uh, we also have to see that the inferior pore of the thyroid is palpable at the time of uh, PSA. Suppose sometimes the inferior pore of the uh, inferior margin of the thyroid is not available, that means they might have a retrosternal extension. And whenever a thyroid has a retrosternal extension, it is always going to be an issue because it comp uh, compresses the trachea and it can be a typical intubation. If you are able to intubate the patient, but you, there will not be any distal, uh, distal uh, uh, opened up airway and you may have an airway collapse during surgery. So these are the things that we have to uh, look at at the name of PSE. Simplest thing is, of course, AP and uh, lateral view of the neck is uh, important at the name of PSE. But suppose if there is a re uh, retro extension, then we have to get a uh, CT chest to look at the compression. So that was at the time of intubation. Second thing, uh, what we may have is uh, that we, we, we may face uh, difficulties, especially a long-standing thyroid, malignant thyroid, uh, uh, is uh, tracheomalacia and the collapse of the tracheal rings. And uh, you may be able to intubate, you may be able to ventilate, but at, at the post extubation patient suddenly the tracheal wall may collapse and patient can go into airway obstruction. So that is one thing that we also have to keep in mind. So airway uh, uh, tracheal rings assessment and intraoperatively is of course done by the surgeon but also the surgeon has to keep that uh, uh, thing in mind. And of course uh, uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerves involvement, uh, unforeseen reasons, especially long standing thyroids and uh, uh, no margins can be involved. You have to keep that in mind, and we always make an assessment of uh, vocal cord uh, functionality at the end of surgeon. At the end of surgery, uh, we have a video laryngoscope. We'll be demonstrating, and also we have intraoperative nerve monitoring uh, equipment that will be demonstrating towards the end of the day. Those are the few things that we have to remember. And uh, post 
operatively yes uh, depending on the thyroid status we have to make sure that uh, we maintain the youth thyroid status because uh, of course uh, majority of them are youth thyroid patients but suppose if the patients are hyperthyroid or hypothyroid and we have to make sure that uh, the thyroid levels are properly controlled because it may have a recurring issues if may the patient can go into thyroid storm uh, we have to keep those things in mind uh, other important thing that we have to keep in mind is a surgical hemostasis we mean to we have to maintain Mean pressures, uh, because suppose if the patient has peri extubation or post operative hypertension, sometimes there might be bleeds which can compress the trachea. So make sure that whenever in the recovery room you have the clippers ready, so that in case if the patient bleeds at the airway compression, you just have to open up the stitches and open up the uh, neck so that uh, the airway compromise doesn't happen. So we can discuss more on this uh, uh, towards the day, but these are these are just few highlights which I have uh, 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 elaborated. Over to you, Doctor Ajay, for, for the day. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, we are ready to answer. Doctor Sai is there with me. Uh, he'll also be ready to answer any questions uh, uh, pertaining to anesthesia. Uh, we, the ball again, rolling yeah. for the youngsters. A lot of yeah. youngsters here. Now, as a surgeon, we want the the blood pressure to be maintained at a specific level. Yes. Which most of the anesthetists are reluctant to do so. Can you give us the what pressure it has to be maintained? So generally, and how do you uh, measure? How do you maintain that? Yeah, generally we maintain around 65, uh, or sometimes we, if the surgeon, uh, if, the, if it's a vascular thyroid, then we maintain a systolic BP of around 90. So that uh, uh, end point is we have to maintain adequate tissue perfusion. So I don't know if you can just turn this uh, and show, show the monitor. Uh, uh, slowly. Uh, yeah, you can just show the surrogate uh, monitor for the surgeon. We have kept one monitor here. Uh, I don't know if you can see. Yeah, we can uh, see that. Yeah, so basically, if you see 80 by 50, 80 by 60, 90 is by this, that's what the pressure we maintain so that we can minimize the uh, blood loss during surgery. Same time, the end point, the tissue perfusion has to be maintained. So whenever you are giving uh, uh, induced hypotension, you have to make sure that the tissue perfusion is not compromised. And at the end of surgery, we have to uh, the hemostasis has to be secured at the normal tensive level so that uh, if at all there is any surgical bleed can be uh, diathermized or can be uh, ligated. So that is an uh, important thing. So techniques you adopt to get that temp uh, that blood pressure? A simple like maintaining adequate depth of anesthesia is uh, solely uh, measured with time it can take control uh, but yes uh, inhalation agent uh, appropriate titration of mac and importantly uh, we use uh, dexmedetomidine alpha 2 agonist dexmedetomidine infusion to maintain this and suppose if the patient is having preoperative uncontrolled pressure then we may take uh, we take the help of uh, pharmacological agents like uh, uh, labetalol or nitroglycerin uh, to control the rate as well as controlled uh, blood pressure because uh, if you are using sole nitroglycerin then you may have reflex tachycardia we don't want that to happen if we have, as you can see in this monitor uh, the pulse rate is around 60 which is ideal we don't want pulse rate of more than 110 or 100 because excessive tachycardia intraoperatively especially in an elderly patient with pro uh, coexisting coronary disease can uh, have its own implications so we have to maintain the myocardial oxygen demands and needs so this is what uh, dexmedetomidine is one useful molecule that we use measured with the time as uh, is being used in this case also so, but yes, whenever you're using these pharmacological agents, you have to make sure that there are the, the drug interactions can be minimized, and most of the anesthesiologists are aware of the potential drug interactions, especially dexmedetomidine with the beta blockers. They can sometimes can cause intense bradycardia. So, those are the things that you have to remember. Thank you, Sunil, yeah. for those inputs. Yeah. Because hypertensive anesthesia is vital importance for any head and neck surgery. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. How often do you use uh, uh, iodine to have that uh, decrease the, say, hyperfunction thyroid? Because uh, I have not seen much of an iodine use. I don't. Yes, we are not dealing with the thyrotoxicosis that most of them are well controlled. Once they are well controlled, uh, the has a limited. The whole thing should be visible. But using it uh, doesn't harm us. So it's a very simple technique, if you have the access to it, and if you use it, it I feel more of a scheduling the uh, yeah, surgery is a, problem. a huge problem, because once you have started on 
uh, iodine it takes at least uh, seven to ten days to act so you have to pre-plan it it has to be fixed i don't think we have enough time for that that is why am i audible from the OT? Okay. Oh, we're in your audible yes. can you start now yes sir so is the surgical field visible to yeah, everyone? the field is visible are you happy with your extension this is the maximum extension that is possible okay so would i think generally the spin is quite stretched okay so, so regarding the extension, we would prefer actually to use a natural crease. So the patient already has a uh, crease here, around two centimeters or two finger breadths around the suprasternal notch. So I prefer to just mark it with the silk so that I don't lose track of it. And I have marked both the sternocleidum asteroid so that my incision does not extend beyond that. Some surgeons also prefer infiltration with cocaine with adrenaline to reduce the bleeding. But we have not that done that in this case. But once the our anesthetist is like uh, Sunil is uh, with an 80, we don't require that. Put a suction. Give me a gauze. I request the audience to participate and ask the questions to the operating surgeons and you can have the maximum benefit out of this. So I think the miles along the corridor they are functional. If you have any doubts whether they are big or small, you can definitely ask uh, the panel members here, myself or even Dr. Baran who is operating. This is more like an interactive session. So here you can see the platysma. So once the sub subcutaneous plane is reached, the pinkish muzzle here. Can you please zoom in? I think it's not seen here. Is is the field better now? Yeah, that's much better. the cameraman to fix his position and then concentrate on the operator field. What is happening is there is a continuous movement there. I think uh, there is an artificial issue. I cannot be zoomed in so much. You can zoom out a bit. If you zoom out, then there will be this constant artifacts issue will be added. Yeah, come out a bit, zoom out a bit more, more panoramic view. But now set it, now set it up properly. It's losing focus. Uh, you have to come, on, come inside a bit more. Gauge. Bit more. Keep it steady, please. Yeah. Go inside more. Go inside a bit more. Yes, that should be fine. Keep it steady there. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Action. Varun, as you are doing the procedure, can you explain the steps? Yeah. So once I have made an incision, so I find the platysma, incise the platysma sharply, then I catch the subplatysmal plane to raise the flaps. So right now what I am doing is I am raising the upper flap. So what he is doing exactly is, is uh, what is called as a flap thyroidectomy. Basically, this is the most common method by which thyroidectomies are done, in which you raise the flap cranially as well as cordially. There are also uh, types of thyroidectomies, I think Rajukar also has been where you don't raise the flap because 
uh, the flaps uh, sometimes uh, associated with some problem. Like post flap, there is a serum of formation. A lot of people do not raise flaps, but here we are taking we raise the subplatysmal flap cranially as well as caudally. So right now you can see he is raising the subplatysmal flap. So for the small tumors, especially in the females who are extremely anxious about the cosmosis, the flapless technique is a superior Ito? functional erotic outcomes. So how far you are going to raise the flaps for him? Cranially and caudally? So cranially I will go up to the hyoid. Okay. And Below, I will go up to the suprasternal notch. That is a classic description. I need more traction. So, the technique by which she is giving traction is the use of skin hooks. So, normally people can tend to use uh, Alice forceps, uh, but this is uh, one of the less dramatic methods by which you can uh, raise the skin flaps. These are uh, it is only a small area of contact and therefore the post-operative period the amount of ecchymosis or a tissue necrosis. Using uh, the skin hooks, I think you can, uh, I think patients should always try to practice this uh, because these are extremely useful, not only in thyroid surgery but other, any surgery in which you are, uh, you require some uh, subcutaneous distraction like breast also. The Mosquito. assistant plays a very important Field role retractor. here. The counter traction that the assistant exerts by retracting the with the skin uh, hooks is of great value to the operator. Never try to see the lattice spine midline. We all know it is deficient. Always try to see at the lateral lens because. Uh, is a very thin muscle which has to be actually you actually have to concentrate to see them once you identify it and so it is a very important point yeah so in the midline the platysma is deficient and becomes more prominent at the lateral aspect okay. now Varun, i think uh, the light has to be adjusted as the uh, um, sisters to adjust the light. Yeah. Uh, and when you yeah. actually lift the flaps, mm -hmm. try to keep uh, the tip of your cartridge towards the muscle. It should be towards the muscle because it is the superficial veins just below the platysma which is going to be in your post period to give you trouble. So if you are very careful not to cure them, raising, you are almost safe uh, in the post operative period. Is the resolution okay for the camera or? No, it's fine, Varun. The only thing is, every time you put in your hand, the autofocus is kind of again uh, trying to get back into the picture. Can you bring so, that? I think the camera can be maybe adjusted slightly to the midline at a higher location. This is what I feel, but overall it's okay. But once you go into depth, I think this position may not be uh, adequate. I'll just once and check once. Okay, give it, leave it. No, put a. Uh, Varun, what are the power settings that you are using for the diathermy and what are you using it? Yeah. I am using the fulgurate mode okay. and then I am placing the coagulation at 30. And, and what about I, the cutting? I have it at pure cut at 30 again. Okay. And then the bipolar setting is also at 30 and which is in a standard mode.
some surgeons prefer raising the entire flap with the knife yeah. retracted there put put hook put a hook here Give me a tie, silk tie. What structure are you like getting, Varun? There was a vessel in the flap, and uh, so I had used a mosquito to just hold it, and that is what I'm like. Give me a silk. Give me that. Hook, please. In this case, are you using intraoperative nerve monitors? Mosquito. 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 There is a question uh, by Dr. Karthik, whether we are using a nerve monitor for this particular patient. No, we are not using a nerve monitor in this case. I think we do have a nerve monitoring system. Um, I think probably we can be using it for the uh, second or the third case. So, is it a routine practice to use the now selectively? And selectively, what are the criteria that you take? There is a lot of camera. Uh, I just adjusting it a little bit. I asked them to raise the height a bit. Maybe you can uh, stop the fake for some time. Uh, I will answer this particular question. You can stop the fake for some time. Yeah. Yes, sir. So I think um, stop the thing. Yeah, I think we need to stop. No issues. Then you can continue. Um, uh, regarding uh, Dr. Raju sir has asked you a question uh, uh, whether we are doing a routine uh, no monitoring, especially for uh, thyroid surgeries. I think in the primary setting we are not doing it, but uh, sometimes when we are doing a recurrent setting, there is a lot of uh, when the when the bed has already been uh, violated prior. And especially post uh, radioiodine ablation or post radiation, where it's extremely different, uh, difficult to differentiate between uh, you know, post arterial fibrosis or radioiodine fibrosis, and the now identification is difficult. Those are settings, I think, in thyroid surgeries at least, uh, where no monitoring can be used. Uh, but yeah, if we have a corrective tumor, definitely uh, it can be used routinely uh, for uh, we are not that keen, uh, no, uh, knowledgeable about the land. You are using now, yes, sir. We have a complete monitoring system, sir. Uh, sometimes we use it, sometimes uh, the neurosurgery department, even the our anesthesiology department also has it. But uh, the system I think which is there in our uh, I think that was will be better to uh, but what I have been uh, understood is that it does not have an audible system, so which is what we need actually. So, um, the Audible, uh, audible system is what uh, we do we lack. I think. So I think he's raising the lower flap now. I think at uh, that position uh, we will kind of not be able to see much. A couple of instruments that we are using among us, what among us, cat spurs. So this is something that's akin to a uh, small uh, skin itself, but it's like as it is. Cat spa. Again, it has got a less uh, uh, crushing uh, aspect as compared to your uh, regular Alex forceps. I recommend the kind of uh, instrument which you should uh, seriously consider when you are planning to do a good thyroid surgery. Uh, nerve monitors that you are using now, they are nerve stimulators or they are nerve? Uh, the Nimpo is a nerve stimulator, sir. So the Nimpo has a 
has a small uh, you can change the settings of the amperage where in which you actually have a direct uh, current to the, uh, the tissue and it has got an, uh, a feedback loop and based upon whether you are actually touching uh, directly touching one of the uh, nerves or the uh, tissue you will get an audible beep so i think when the feed has been lost that has been pumped to me so um, the advantage of that system is that uh, it has got a special audible uh, um, signal when you touch uh, something other than a nerve and uh, it has got a special signal when you touch the nerve directly and it has got a special signal when you touch one of the branches of the nerve that is in terms of the amplitude as well as its uh, intensity so i think it is quite useful especially for people who are uh, not doing parotid surgery uh, regularly uh, the nerve monitoring system is, is very very useful according to me i think you can pan back to the uh, otp on I think we have a leader from the anterior jugular, so I'll just give me a moment to just. Elevate it. Suction. Suction. Give me a white wheel. Which. What is this? Oh. So actually, uh, while well, Varun is uh, performing this uh, procedure, we are actually um, having uh, a tea and coffee which has been served right now. Those of you who can, um, who are wishing, you can take a small uh, uh, break and come back. So Varun, is that uh, is it one of the uh, jugular veins? One of the jugular veins. Yeah. So this is uh, something which is does. Uh, Commonly, uh, when you are raising the flap, uh, these are the veins which drain the anterior part, and uh, especially when you are raising the flap at the uh, bottommost part, this is where they actually come close together and close to the platysma. And sometimes they do break. There is nothing to panic in this particular situation. Uh, we just have what is done is he has taken a, uh, taken a bite, and uh, his uh, the bleeding. Yes, madam, you have a question. Sir, I just want you to tell how to approach without raising flap for thyroidectomy. I can't hear. Without raising flap for thyroidectomy, how to approach for thyroid? Yeah. Dr. Raju sir, sir, can you can you answer the question? Yes. Once we make the skin incision, ma'am, yeah. and divide the platysma, we go directly on the same incision. Same incision. Okay, sir. Same incision. Go divide the platysma. Okay, sir. Divide the investing. In the midline, divide the investing layer of deep cervical fascia without raising the flaps. Line, vertical line, sir. Yeah, vertical line, same okay. line. So what happens is the tumor or the nodule is deep to the fascia. For sir. Deep to the yes. strap muscles. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. By retracting the the philosophy behind the flapless technique is by raising the flaps cranially and caudally, yes. we are unlikely to achieve anything. So what you do is directly go on to the thyroid uh, fascia, identify the nodule and divide the, carry out your procedure, be it a total thyroidectomy, be it uh, a lobectomy or a hemithyroidectomy. Sir, in that case, so exposure is equally good? Equally good. Okay. So I think, sir, uh, there is one clarification. I, I think you have to below the strap muscle, sir. We have to divide the strap muscles. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. There is no yeah. need to divide the strap. Yeah, because, uh, okay. You cut in the midline, the fascia, raise the flap then. I am not talking about the skin flaps. Underneath the strap okay. muscles, okay. you raise the tissues, planes, there, get onto the tumor directly and carry out the procedure. Thank you. This is the flapless yeah. technique. But it is very good for the small tumors. For small tumors. But for small tumors also, you have to go for hemithyroidectomy at least. Yes, either a lobectomy or a hemithyroidectomy. Sir, could it be done without raising flap? Yes, it can be done safely. We have done. It can be done. Give me an okay. 
No, the idea is basically uh, you are raising the skin flap above, then you are separating the strap muzzle, again going back to the thyroid and raising the same amount below the strap muzzle. So the idea here is to raise below the strap muzzle to achieve the same thing without raising the superficial part. Imagine yourself, man, when you are raising the skin flaps up to the higher bone above and below up to the suprasternal notch, when you are doing the procedure, is it serving any purpose? That's and it. always I think that, but yes, I never tried without raising flap, I could approach to the thyroid. Yeah, I think the maximum amount of uh, uh, exposure you will get only that deep to the strap muscles, not about the strap muscles. That is, I think, the basic philosophy of a uh, flapless thyroidectomy. Uh, so, Varun, just um, show us what you are doing right now. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Yes, so, uh, I have a question. So, actually, about the surgery which is going on, so I want to ask, like, what kind of uh, thyroid surgery is this? Like, uh, total thyroidectomy? Or this is a right hemithyroidectomy. Right. The model is less than uh, four centimeters, and um, uh, for that particular patient, and when there are no other modules, uh, the isthmus are in the contralateral lobe, and when there is no actual uh, proof that we are dealing with malignant. Basic and the simplest procedure is the right Yeah. So any associated uh, structures that are being uh, removed in this surgery along? No, no. This is a non palpable module. There is no evidence of any extra tension. So there is no need for doing any other additional surgery like you know strap muscles excision or even lymph node lymphadenectomy also. I think that is what you are thinking. No, we are not going for any form of lymphadenectomy or lymph node dissection. This is a simple right hemithyroidectomy. Thank you, sir. Yeah. During this part of the dissection, I use uh, Joel's retractor, uh -huh. yes. which is a great tool, very, very uh, not very expensive, so it will make the job of the assistant that much easier. Yeah, I think the Joel's retractor is not uh, uh, the Joel, one of the lands uh, of uh, thyroid surgery, even the uh, of Joel himself. And uh, as Sir says, exactly you can do surgery with a single assistant. You don't need a second assistant when you have a Jules retractor. Instead of having the Jules, what we usually do is you use the suture, especially the 10 silk, and uh, four quadrants you try to uh, tag it up. Especially when you do the uh, head, uh, say you would have separately. Uh, in, I don't use foldables. I usually do, uh, wrap the head when I do. The so you fix it to the uh, sticking that is there and it keeps, it almost serves the same purpose. Yeah, it's a good alternate. It's a good alternate. So, Varun, you are right now uh, dividing the strap muscles in the midline? Yes, right yeah. now I'm dividing the strap muscles in the bent line. Yeah. So it is very very important that you have to identify the midline. That's the most important step in uh, uh, the second part of uh, thyroid surgery. First is obviously you have to raise the flaps, and the second part is you have to identify the midline uh, to divide the strap muscles. So one of the ways you can identify is, uh, is that the strap muscles will diverge as you go inferiorly. And therefore, some people start uh, raising the flap, uh, raising or dividing the strap muscles inferiorly to cranially. Another technique uh, which I have is uh, you just use the cautery over the strap muscles, the strap muscles tend to contract. So, once there is a contraction of uh, the bilateral strap muscles, there is a small dip in between and can be used for uh, entering the midline. And for a clean bloodness and a good surgery, identification of that midline holds a lot of uh, importance. You take uh, two, three minutes extra just to identify that that decreases your uh, identification rate the way you do it. Especially this is a huge problem when you deal with uh, already a hemithyroidectomy done. You are going for a completion thyroidectomy. Very difficult to identify again. It's most of the time you would have approximated the straps. So during this we do a lateral approach where you tend to identify the homohyoid and come from behind the homohyoid towards the midline 
instead of opening the midline first there especially your uh, incision should be more say at least you should cover half of your uh, sternomastoid so that you can identify the omohoid underneath it so your incision will not be enough as you are doing here So in other words, the lateral approach is the one that you prefer when you somebody has already operated. Sir, so actually, I wanted to know why don't we extend the incision to the posterior border of right sternocleidomastoid? Because we're doing a right hemicellar to give a better uh, visualization. So, Varun, can you answer that? Uh, uh, the mics uh, in the audience are not audible. Can you? Okay. Then in that case, uh, we will take up that. Nay, uh, can they ask that again a little loud? Yeah, so I wanted to know why the incision is not up to the posterior border of the right sternocleidomastoid because it's a right hemithyroidectomy, right? So in most cases, you can get away because this is a small nodule. Okay. Uh, you don't have to extend it all the way up to the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, though that is the classical uh, this thing uh, described lesion. Okay. So as you can see, uh, see I have retracted the straps and you can very well see the right lobe of the thyroid. I don't know if it is. No, we are not mm. able to see the visuals from the radiator. Can you just show it? Can yeah, show we it? can see now. So you can find your incision up to the sternomastoid. Generally, we don't go beyond that because it is cosmetically disfiguring. Unless it is absolutely necessary, we should not cross over the sternomastoid. Okay. Because there is underlying muscle there which will lead to a bad scar. Sir, I also wanted to know this flap, uh, flapless technique you're telling. Is that a method similar to the tracheostomy horizontal incision we give when uh, uh, yeah, enter something the middle? Similar. Something, something similar. Something similar. We don't raise the flaps in a tracheostomy. Yeah. No, this is, most of the people across the globe, they follow the, the flap, flap technique. <laughs> there are few centers who started this flapless technique. Okay. In their hands, it's good enough. So once you are an experience, then you can go to the flapless techniques. But to be, as a beginner, I think probably it is better to stick to the conventional yes. practice. Yes, thank you. Also, sir, is uh, flapless technique better for larger thyroids as compared because? Or uh, not for very large tumors. Okay. At uh, this stage of surgery, uh, we should be all is uh, mindful of any evidence of extrathyroidal extension to the strap muscles and if it? at all there is any uh, sonographic evidence of uh, extension we will have to divide the strap muscles at this point of time okay. instead of going below the sternothyroid so in this case there is no extrathyroidal extension but if at all there is an extrathyroidal extension straps have to be divided at that level that technique is meant primarily for the benign surgeries and for very early stage thyroid malignancies, not for extra thyroid extension tumors. Bipolar? So I have the right lobe of the thyroid. I hope it's visible. Uh, it's visible. Can you localize the tumor on the surface? Of, uh, there, where is the tumor? This is the tumor. Okay. The one in my forceps. Okay. This is the tumor. So still, once you retract the strap muscles, there will be some fibers of strap muscles which will be attached to the gland. So you can gently tease them away with a bipolar. That should work. Or you can use a sponge and stick to do that. There are fine vessels which you can see on the thyroid capsule and that is the plane to maintain. Is that visible? Actually, as you move along the lobe of the thyroid, you should be moving closer to the thyroid. You don't want extra tissue than the thyroid. So, keep that is called uh, capsular, subcapsular dissection, where you keep your plane on the thyroid as much as possible as you go along the lateral side, but don't dip inside once it is beyond it. Don't dip in because that is the place where your nerve will enter. So, until you shift over to the anterior and the lateral surface, it is fine. But once you are moving towards the inner surface, you should be careful not to dip inside. 
this part of the dissection can be done a uh, variety of techniques. So what Varun is practicing is with a sponge. Some people do with a bipolar only. Some people use uh, monopolar at low settings. And some people use scissors. So generally, where do you start from, uh, Varun? Is it from this? I usually thing? look for the middle thyroid vein. Oh, you look for the middle thyroid vein. Okay. So sometimes it's not seen, and most of the times, once you ligate that, you get a better traction on the lobe. So then I start raising the inferior. I get the inferior pole off. Then I move to the superior take the superior pedicle and then come back laterally, identify the RLN, the thyroid arteries and then do it. So the sequence varies from surgeon to surgeon. What's your practice, Arvind? I usually start with the superior pole, but I'm on the opposite side. I never started from the superior side. Okay. So it is the right lobe of thyroid. I'm on the left side of the patient. Yes. I start with the upper pole of the left side. That is how I do it. And most of the time, I ligate the upper pole before I come down uh, to do it. You can see the middle thyroid vein very clearly here. Sorry, I think uh, the cameraman yeah. has to adjust. The, ah, now it's better. Can you point it out? So this is the one. Can you see it? Yeah, that's the middle thyroid vein. Can Kati, you see this? What's your practice? So what the sequence in right angle? As a, I have learned every surgery from Raja sir himself. So I practice what I have been assisting him. So our usual practice is to go to the superior pole first, tackle the anterior division of the superior thyroid artery. Then that will open some more space and the branch of the etching laryngeal now will all automatically go slightly upwards. Then we retract the superior pole Tackle the posterior division of the superior thyroid okay. Superior pole first. Oh. So I'm ligating the middle thyroid vein. Yeah. Again, several surgeons have many techniques. For this. Uh, some people use only clips. Some do only bipolar as well. Practice changes between. Give me a ligature. you have to be fast huh? don't retard so much. Uh, the problem of doing it from the opposite side makes you change the pace twice when you are doing a total thyroid but that as dr arvin said yes <laughs> usually for going to the superior pole the opposite side sometimes is easier uh, yeah, any preference to the uh, enlarged versus non -enlarged, normal lobe, I usually start with the pathological lobe always. Uh, I uh, do the same. Yeah, most I start with the pathological lobe. Percep. Retract. But in cases where already had a no palsy i would prefer to operate on the normal side when i am fresh to take care of the intact mouse and then go to the other side the sequencing doesn't matter much it all depends upon finally what you do The middle thyroid vein does not have an accompanying artery. So, giving a obscuring it will lead to a lot of bleeding and obscure the whole field. So, it's also a very good practice to secure it first and then give the traction. That is so, correct. The reason why most people take the middle thyroid vein first is because once you give a medial traction, that tends to avulse very fast. Uh, Arvind, uh, what percentage of our patients had uh, middle Light, thyroid vein? Please. Almost 30 percent lack it. 70 yeah. percent will have, and uh, majority of them will have on one side. That's having every. I think 
think it is 50 50. Say every side you get a middle thyroid vein is 50 50. Most of the people will have only one side vein, which you will be able to identify when you are doing a total thyroid. And most of the time it's very small, just can be bipolarized. Is it attractive? Smaller retract. So what I'll do now is try the sphere lobe. Retractor. The superior lobe leads a very good assistant because uh, the assistant will have one hook which is pulling vertically, the other hook pulling onto the right angle side. So if the uh, assistant doesn't understand that he has to do this, we'll have a lot of trouble getting into the superior pole to visualize. So because you have two hands working Can in you two focus? different Can you focus on uh, directions. Can you focus on the field, please? We're just waiting so that everyone can have a view of the field. There is some focusing issue here. okay let's proceed so this you can see them i think arvind we have to ask the cameraman to for make him be, feel much more clearer because we're not having good visuals here i don't think you have to be so close by or close zoomed i think a little bit zoom should help and a little away should help Okay, this is better. I think the assistant's left hand retractor should be underneath the strap muscle so that you can have a better visuals from there. Better. He's retracting the skin. Yeah. Retractor. It's very important to give the proper instruction to our assistants, especially the right hand and the left. The right hand has to... Can you see now? Yeah, now it's much better. So I have lifted up the right lobe so yes. that there is some traction. So, so this was possible because I took the middle thyroid vein, otherwise that would have been avulsed. And I slightly I have mobilized the inferior lobe as well so that I can get that traction. And now I am onto the superior lobe. Okay. So there is a, once I go to the superior lobe, there is a specific maneuver that the assistant has to do. They have to retract the superior lobe laterally, okay, so that I'll do that. Give bipolar. So during this part of the dissection, some surgeons do divide the part of the muscle so, so that I am doing that. I'm going to do that, okay. So, you can see part of the strap that is coming here. So, it's probably if you are having difficulty in accessing the superior pole, you can just cut a few fibers of that. A bipolar would do. So, that will increase the traction. Uh, mainly dividing the upper part of the basically it will be on the inner aspect of the straps the inner aspect few fibers you put up, the upper pole becomes well visible when you it definitely helps never hesitate to cut that because your upper pole uh, visualization is very good and you can identify your nerve better when you do that
Can you see me teasing out a few fibers there? You can see. I think it's not good. Yeah, now the exposure is much better because of the, the, the assistant has changed the position of the retractor. Hopefully done. When you are seeing, he is trying to move the superior pole laterally that is what because usually that is the less uh, uh, problematic side so you try to try to push the superior pole slightly towards the lateral side so that you have enough space there unless you don't see the space there you can't see the nerve above so you have to be very careful slowly make a space on the medial aspect of the upper pole of the thyroid so basically there is an AVS space between the superior pole and the cricothyroid muscle here. So, if you carefully tease that out and identify that space, that will help in identifying the external laryngeal branch and also you could safely ligate the superior pedicle that way. For the sake of the youngsters, it is called the space of Reeves. So, if you remain in that vascular plane between the cricothyroid and the superior pole thyroid, it will be easier for you. So that will require dissection on both sides, medial and lateral. I need the table up. Now, Varun, can you show us that uh, a vascular space? Yeah, so you can, so it's not completely oh. So you can see the space here. Can you please focus? Okay, so this is the upper, this is the lobe, right? Please please move your hand. Yeah, this is the right lobe. So what I am holding is the upper pole. So this is the upper pole. I'll show it again. So this is the upper pole, and here is going to be the avascular space of Reeves. Can you see that? Yeah. So it's not completely dissected. Yeah. So, I am giving lateral traction so that I can separate this upper pole from the cricothyroid muscle and then form this space. So, once that space is formed, what you can see, you can beautifully see the upper pedicle, uh, the vessels going in and then you can see the external laryngeal branch going to the cricothyroid. These are again some of the strap muscle fibers which I am just coagulating. Give the traction. Hold 
right angle you can see that space being developed this is the upper pole this is the critical muscle hold bipolar Vessels and the now. Right angle. Can you see the upper pole artery and the vein? Can you just one? We can see one branch. Is that the anterior branch? That seems to be the anterior branch. Let okay. me just. The superior thyroid artery divides into two branches: the anterior and posterior. Give me part. Part of it. What you did you to... identify the now? Come into picture yet, sir? But I'll just show it to you in a while. Give me this thing. Peanut, peanut, please. So I think now the nerve will be posterior to the posterior division of the superior thyroid artery most of the time. So right now he is tackling the anterior division. Bipolar. So once he gets control over that, along the medial wall, uh, called Jones triangle, that is where we will be able to find the superior laryngeal nerve. Give me this thing, sponge on stick. This small bleeder from the X, from a branch of the superior pedicle vessel, just tackling it with a bipolar. Copious amount of irrigation, keep on flushing with saline, take time, be patient, again go back, Give mop, please. see. Initially, you can take a long time to do it, don't worry about it because uh, being slow and meticulous will make you good to see these structures. So, it is very important you keep on uh, irrigating, mopping, and making the field clear very often. So you can see the 
just show it wait 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 yeah can you focus there yeah we can see uh, the structure crossing uh, above the anterior division yeah. of the superior thyroid artery in a horizontal towards the cricothyroid muscle yes so what i am retracting here with the sponge and stick is the cricothyroid yeah once i place that traction you can see the vessel so i'll try and throw, uh, slowly dissect that out and then take the upper pedicle how close is it to the superior pole the varun it's quite close actually ah. in this case so that's why we have to be careful because there are a lot of anatomical variations sometimes yes. it's high up sometimes it goes very close right, right. especially in these uh, low down the injury rates are higher so some people adopt a strategy wherein they identify the external laryngeal now first and label it as whatever it is especially the type 2b which is below the superior pole of the thyroid and dips down and then ascends up is at a high risk of injury bipolar And on stick. Right angle. Got me. previously the concept of taking the upper pole vessels very close to the gland sometimes do that blindly even if you are close to the gland sometimes you can injure the external laryngeal gland so it's always a good idea to this lateral dissect the vessel space of release and then proceed with ligation give right angle traction traction bipolar the superior pole the terminal yes, branch yeah. but i always take a extra precaution of putting a clip so what i have ligature to still like my person size still i am not in uh, i just have seen many places where they tend to yeah. bipolar the superior pole with the modern uh, the machines uh, Retractor, but uh, for the so now the superior pole is like completely yeah. mobilized off. So you can see the amount of traction we have got. This, as Dr. Evans said, sometimes is easier on the lateral side to detect the vascular space of leaves. That's just a surgeon preference. So you have completed the superior pole section. Correct. Now you're retracting the superior pole medially. The, yes. the assistance is retracting it. 
so that the tracheoesophageal groove gets opened up and then that loose areolar tissue gets deleted and you want to dissect the recurrent laryngeal now and the inferior thyroid artery. Correct. And this step, I try to use the forceps, use the areolar tissue and give some traction. That gives me some better visibility over that area. Then probably use a cold mosquito. Just a minute, please uh, don't proceed. There is no focus. The area is not clear to the audience. Yeah. Can you focus again? And then the assistant who is holding the retractor, he has to rip it down and pull it uh, away from the field. Can you come a little bit closer to the camera? Focus again. It's better now. No. Yeah, that's okay. Is that fine? Yeah, that's much better. And ask the assistants to dip the hand in his hand. Yeah, I'll do that. Gosh. No, dip, dip. Give me a gosh. Yeah, it's much better now. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Sit down. So what I sometimes do is I palpate for the trachea below because I have already in, uh, part of the inferior lobe. So here you can see my finger palpating the trachea. So then I get an idea of where the tracheoesophageal groove is. So in that case, so I don't have to, so I don't go very deep or very superficial. So here is the trachea, and I know that this usually is the plane or need to be careful. So there is a, a triangle wherein the um, the common character artery laterally, medially is the trachea and perennially is the inferior pole of the thyroid gland. That triangle will identify the recurrent laryngeal now. That's a, a crude way. So the classic triangles which are described, the lateral and medial boundaries more or less are the same. Uh, the external carotid artery and midline, the trachea or the midline, whatever you take. The superior, based on which triangle uh, description you are looking at, the bare triangle is usually the inferior thyroid artery, which is the superior aspect, the base of that triangle. It is the lower pole, it is called as the lower east triangle. And another triangle known as Simon triangle, which where the upper side of the triangle is made by the cricothyroid muscle. So more or less they point to the same area, the tracheoesophageal to the little extra level in dissecting this out. Sito. You tend to become more patient, slow once you enter the tracheoesophageal groove and you see the carotid being pushed to the laterality. In between this place, work very slowly, use uh, uh, sharp tipped instruments slowly layer by layer if you go ahead because this is the place you are trying to dissect and identify your recurrent line. Is it mosquito? No, no. Give traction. For the budding uh, surgeons, uh, uh, a book, uh, The Atlas of uh, Head and Neck Surgery. Unfortunately, we don't have the newer edition. The older edition was uh, published more than 15 years ago. I don't know whether any new edition has come up. It is uh, basically a pictorial depiction about the anatomy and the surgical 
steps i think uh, varun i think you need to change the position of the hand uh, slightly for the sake of the audience is this retractor coming in the way a uh, retractor is okay now it's retract is fine i think the camera i think you can get it this way yeah side. i have to change the angle i think it's focused from inferior where yeah, it is focused from inferior it has to come a uh, little lateral yeah either lateral or the straight uh, cranio caudal view Right yeah, that's good. Just focus it there and let him keep it still. Some amount of patience is required with these small twigs. Sir, from a bipolar. Is it? Very small twigs that are going directly into the thyroid. I usually tend to just bipolar them. Give me a pause. Right angle. One with as the textbooks previously used to write uh, ligate the superior pole as close and uh, inferior pole as uh, away as possible is wrong because as you see, they tend to bipolarize the vessels What's which it? are entering into the thyroid. So your dissection and your ligation is close to the thyroid and not away from the thyroid for inferior for thyroid artery. Just remember this because you are supposed to go close to the thyroid, not away from the thyroid. This, this looks to be the tubercle of Zucker candle. Can you see this here? Yeah, we can see that. Why do you identify that? No, that's for the sake of the audience. That sometimes acts as a landmark where you can identify the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So, the recurrent laryngeal nerve can adjust at the point of the tubercle of Zucker candle. Usually, it lies just below that. So, you identify generally cranially the recurrent laryngeal nerve? I identified inferiorly. Right angle. What is that structure? Is any glandular tissue seen there? That's the parathyroid. That's the parathyroid. Yeah, that okay. is the parathyroid. Yeah. So usually you never ligate the inferior thyroid artery at its root because that is the one that gives again branches to the parathyroid gland. If you see the old textbooks as Arvind was mentioning, they used to 
discuss about ligating the inferior parietal artery very laterally as far away from the gland as possible but with that the people have found out that there is a higher incidence of hyperparathyroidism because the blood supply to the no, parathyroid no, no, primarily comes from the inferior thyroid artery you need to identify terminal branches By and you also have to identify the arcade between the inferior thyroid artery and the superior thyroid artery and it's supplied to the parathyroid because the parathyroid arterial supply is an end arterial supply so you have to preserve the vascularity of the parathyroids and therefore these days the practice is always identify the inferior thyroid artery the parathyroid gland and the blood supply to them and try to preserve them so can you see the para uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve here yeah we can see that give me a forceps or a pointer this is the one and these are the branches of the inferior thyroid artery and this is the recurrent laryngeal nerve crossing over like this yeah so once you identify the recurrent laryngeal nerve the dissection from here can proceed little faster but again chances of injury of the recurrent laryngeal nerve are sometimes more above than below bipolar yeah can as you can appreciate on the right side recurrent laryngeal nerve has got a more oblique course because it uh, winds over the subclavian artery i am using only bipolar because sometimes i found it to be easier that way for the small twigs even ligature sometimes tend to skip uh, so how do you tend to identify the current say in a bigger thyroid you are not able to identify at this point so how would you proceed uh, trying to identify the nerve otherwise so for example sometimes you have a large tumor arising in the lower pole uh, then it would be difficult uh, from the uh, using the traditional approach as identifying it from below then in those group of patients generally i go to the cricothyroid junction and identify the now there right you need to adopt different strategies for the different scenarios conventional practice is to go from below upwards yes. some people do it from above downwards both are good techniques depending upon the feasibility and the practicality yeah that needs little bit of experience to identify it at the cricothyroid junction the uh, for uh, just a couple of days ago i had a large tumor from the lower pole of the thyroid right. which is going into area below the aortic arch and then it is extremely vascular and when my colleague has started he has found a lot of bleed and we are unable to identify the recurrent laryngeal now uh, on the left side so what happened is the recurrent laryngeal now was within the substance of the in the wall of right, the right. Uh, esophagus and therefore i had to identify the branches of the recurrent laryngeal now at the cricopharyngeal cric junction a uh, tracheoesophageal junction cranially and then go in a caudal direction so but it sometimes it's needed that kind of clip for in patients who underwent multiple surgeries especially somebody who underwent a central neck dissections previously yep. and develops a recurrence uh, then probably the approach from above downwards is safer bipolar Sir, the same thing goes on to say that you have a mid polar or an upper polar tumor. You need to try to Leave search it. it at the entrance of your. This say you are not getting it higher above. You try to see it lower in the tracheoesophageal groove. Wait patiently. Uh, this and then chase it from below upwards. Yeah. So, so the uh, the advantage of tracing from below upwards is generally it is a constant in position. It is wider. and as it goes up sometimes it divides the branches before it gets into the blurring substance 
So below upwards is easier, but in special circumstances, we may have to go from above downwards. And one thing is, as they really describe, it is pearly white in color. You keep irrigating, see again, keep irrigating, see. When I say pearly white, it is slight yellowish white in color when you see. It's a very constant finding. It is never straight. It is slightly torches, which you observe for the nerve. It will be slightly torches as it enters into the cricothyroid membrane. These are the ways you try to identify the nerve from other fibers that you are trying to. Another important aspect is we need to preserve mental that supply of the current laryngeal now. The vasa nervosa has to be kept intact. That means the sheath has to be left intact. Otherwise, you may have a structurally uh, uh, now, but a non-functioning now. Mosquito. See, this again is again, can you point out here, the camera? Yeah, we can see the now beautifully there. So, but see here below, still away from the True. thyroid. Here is the spot. Sometimes you can tend to damage if you're not yes. very careful. Generally, Just there is one small trick from the inferior thyroid artery, which goes medially. That has to be secured. So, did you identify the parathyroids uh, during this part of the dissection, uh, Varun? Yeah, this is the parathyroid. Yeah. So it's a now the superior parathyroid. Now we can see the superior parathyroid uh, yeah. posterior lateral to the recurrent laryngeal now. Correct. The constant one is the inferior parathyroid. Especially when it is enlarged, you should be very careful while doing the dissection for an inferior parathyroid because most of the time it will be sitting on the nerve. On the nerve, be close to the parathyroid as possible. Don't try to venture too far away from the parathyroid unless you identify it. So our importance should be to identify the nerve first and then deal with the parathyroid. So now I have safely at least traced the recurrent laryngeal nerve all the way where it enters the cricothyroid muscle. You can see it here along its course. Is it dividing? It giving some branches there? Any medial branch? So that is the main trunk. Okay. That is the main trunk. Okay. As you can see, the traction is increasing. That is the hard part of the uh, gland that they are trying to release. This is the Berry's ligament, which we say. Very common place where you tend to Attraction has to be there, some amount of gland let at that place while you are doing initially for a benign thyroid is okay. You need not be too meticulous uh, at that place and uh, clear the thyroid because uh, when you are doing, you need more amount of pressure to get this away from the uh, trachea. You need a lot of pressure to take it away from the trachea. That is correct. This part where you dissected of the berry ligament can be done with a bipolar or a cautery as well. Just beware that the trachea is just below. Especially when you are doing a thyroidectomy during the thyroiditis, this part is very, very difficult to do. It usually will be stuck there. It will not open up from the uh, nerve as it is opening up here. So you will be literally blind at the place where the nerve enters into the cricothyroid. Be very careful. Try to tease it away with leaving a small sliver of tissue around it so that you don't injure it. One. Sometimes your pressure will tend to make a small button don't panic there it is not going to make any much of a difference also you just have to lobe out of it 
to keep some amount of surgical emphysema for four five days uh, with your uh, uh, suction drain not holding for uh, your two to three days eventually it will be all right okay. eventually it will be all right so you need not manic if by chance you put a small button hole into the trachea so even the the angulation of the cautery is quite important because you will be on the trachea so make sure you don't dip in okay see that the whole gland has been moved off and what you can see this whitish structure is the trachea so i have shaved that off along by using a cautery as well so i'll go a little further so that i can include the isthmus also while transecting the gland Give me a clamp. Retractor. Clamp. In our non-cautery era, I remember my professors used to suture this part of the uh, this meticulously for avoiding bleeding. Nowadays, I. We don't buy. I use monopolar cutry just to cut and have an hemostasis there. That is fine. Uh, we never had any issues with cutting uh, regular monopolar uh, monopolar cutry for uh, long or maybe regular right, just if you are still talking about. Give me a clamp. 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 Clamp.
which i don't think will help you much Gosh. with uh, uh, the frozen section being done immediately in fact there was a study from mayo clinic which looked at this data and they mentioned that there is a 50% error rate which is no better than a toss of a coin so therefore they abandoned it just for the benefit of the audience again so this is the completed thyroidectomy bed so it has to be clean you will have to look at the hemostasis currently i don't see any uh, oozing or anyway i'll ask the anesthesia team to get the bp back to baseline that's quite important because if there are small oozers you can tackle them immediately here you can see the recurrent laryngeal nerve give me a pointer Can you see that? Yeah, we can see the now the parathyroids, the trachea being yeah. retracted by the assistant, the cricothyroid muscle. Could you also point out towards the carotid artery and the triangles? It will be easier now because sure, I'll do there that. is no load to obscure it now. The carotid artery? Yeah. At give me the a retracted. carotid sheath if you haven't, uh, because we don't open it at this stage. Yeah. So it's quite easy to get to it. So what you have to do is you have to identify the sternocleidom asteroid. The medial border of the sternocleidom asteroid, you take an incision on that fascia. Give me a cautery. small ooze from the previously ligated vessel, so I'll just tackle that. Give me artery. Give me a Babcock. Retractor below. Right here. Give me an, one more Babcock. Babcock, please. Don't you have a Babcock? Okay, hold it. Hold this up. Sorry. Mosquito. Hmm. Hold it. Give me some light here. This you can see the back door approach also. So can you see the IJV here? Give me a gauze. I think the parotid, the carotid pulsations were well seen prior also. You could have yeah, yeah. shown on to the pulsation and gone. Through. We are actually able to see the vagus now, the IJV. Okay, the, yeah. Everything is seen. So this approach is actually also called as the lateral approach to thyroid. If you can uh, if there is a problem or an op already operated patient and the midline approach is going to be difficult, you can uh, hold the sternocleidum asteroid, retract it laterally, expose the carotid sheath. So here you can see the IJV, you can see the vagus and you can see the carotid pulsations. An important lesson for the next is the way he handled the pleat. See there was a pleat 
So what he is, uh, what he has done is just pack it, and compress it. Most of the time it stops. The field remains clean, and they carry out the entire surgical procedure. But at the same time, they will control the blood vessel, the bleeding source. Packing is the simplest technique which has to be used to keep the area clean. We lost the visuals. Laptop. What are the cartridge settings you prefer, sir? As uh, uh, I use the pure current mode, mm. pure mode, and uh, 30 the same 35, thing has to go. Huh? Thirty or thirty-five, and bipolar thirty-five. I keep tend to keep the bipolar at twenty. Right? No, okay. five minutes. <laughs> So actually the other OT is also getting ready, so we will have to use the same camera. So can you give a wash? Uh, Varun, it is beautifully done. Thank you uh, so much. Demonstrating all the critical steps and clarifying the most of the doubts of the audience. A big round of applause to the operating surgeon. Uh, second case, Dr. Shribar, can you just Dr. demonstrate the positioning of the patient before dropping? You can go to the other OT. So, we'll send the camera to the other OT. So, Dr. Sridhar will guide through the positioning as well. Thank you so much to the panel and the audience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Varun. Thank you. Uh, previously, when we used to do, there was a way where we used to put a round uh, roller underneath the neck so that the mm -hmm. uh, bleeding uh, spine does not get injured. Correct. But so I found it to be time uh, very <laughs> irritating when you actually <laughs> tend to do it for an extension for an head and neck. I think not Adi having it at place but having it below the scapular blade is the trick to have a good extension rather than having a round uh, uh, pillow just below the neck. So that is how uh, unless you have any specific spondylitis or some cervical spine problems I would still prefer not using it and putting the patient to an extension when you are required. Any questions from the audience, from the delegates? Sir, how are you? Can you comment the mic for the sake of the other people? Good morning, sir. I am Dr. Vijay Kumar, Professor of Surgery from GMC Nizamabad. So, I want to ask a small question. While doing uh, exposing the lobes, do we go uh, beneath the tracheal fascia or above the pretracheal fascia, anterior layer? Varun, are you still there with us? Okay. So, sorry, can you repeat it, please? And while dissecting the thyroid lobe, do we go beneath the anterior layer of the pretracheal fascia or above the pretracheal fascia? Sir, actually, what happens is uh, here. The deep uh, cervical fascia actually splits into two. It accommodates the uh, thyroid as it goes up. So when you are tending to do an extra capsular dissection, you are actually dissecting the superficial uh, layer of this. So I don't think you are going behind the sleeve because the pretracheal fascia would have engulfed the trachea and the thyroid uh, lobe together. So you are looking at a space in between these two where this deep cervical fascia is actually engulfing the thyroid going upwards towards getting. Uh, so I don't think we really have this. The trick with the fascia that you are looking at is actually a split fascia anterior and posterior. And when you are doing an extra capsular dissection, actually you are tending to move all the uh, facial structures away from the lobe. So you are only picking out the lobe through the fascia. Okay. Actually, we do in small thyroids, thyroid lobes, we go above the pretracheal fascia. If it is a larger lobe, big gland, 
and a big thyroid it is uh, better to go deeper to pretracheal fascia as the pretracheal fascia is well developed because of the traction that has uh, been put to that pretracheal fascia so it will be stretched and healthy and thick you can go deeper to it as we practice thank you sir. thank you for the inputs So am I visible? No, we are. No, it's not visible to us. Yeah, I think they can. Uh, have, yeah. yeah, now you are visible. Yeah. So good afternoon uh, to the latecomers who have come, uh, and I think there is an excellent uh, demonstration of uh, uh, very safely and simply performed hemithyroidectomy by Dr. Varun, uh, who is part of our team. So I think the second uh, case is also getting ready. So I will start off with the case capsule. So this is a 26-year-old female who has presented. With a complaint of uh, swelling in front of the neck, uh, along with the difficulty of in swallowing since the past three months, she does not have any other features suggestive of hoarseness <coughs> or difficulty in breathing. So, in examination, uh, she was uh, found to have multiple nodules: uh, one about two into one centimeters over the region of the right lobe, another one at the junction of the right lobe in isthmus about two point five into one centimeter, and another nodule about three into one point five centimeters. With a left lobe nodule also about two into one point five uh, centimeters. So essentially, uh, a multinodular uh, goitric enlargement of the thyroid, and clinically she was U thyroid. So she was investigated with an ultrasound, and um, which shows the following features: multiple nodules in the right lobe as well as the left lobe, one of size two point one into one point three centimeters, thyroid four, and the two lesions. Uh, 13 into 6 mm and 2.1 into 1.6 centimeters, uh, respectively. Thyroid 3 and thyroid 2. So she underwent an FNAC uh, <coughs> from the most significant lesions, that is the thyroid 3 as well as the thyroid 4 lesions, and uh, one of them has come as benign, that is category 2, as has been explained by Dr. Khushbu, that it is benign, and the third is come as ATP of undetermined significance. So we have given the option. Uh, basically, she has got a multinodular goiter, uh, which actually can be observed, but she was keen on getting a surgery primarily for a cosmetic indication, and therefore she was being planned for a total thyroidectomy. Prior to that, her thyroid profile, both clinically she was euthyroid as well as biochemically also she was euthyroid, and both the vocal cords were mobile. So the plan right now is to go for a total thyroidectomy under general anesthesia. So uh, this was actually a three-part. um a presentation which was actually planned for uh, a parotidectomy a thyroidectomy and a parathyroidectomy so as uh, the patients uh, have been only predominantly thyroid we still wanted to go ahead with the discussion part of parathyroid disease and parathyroid adenomas per se um so hypercalcemia is one of the things that we commonly see in our hospital that is asian institute of gastroenterology uh, because most of the patients come with us with pancreatitis and during the evaluation of pancreatitis Uh, then what we feel is that a lot of the patients are then undergo uh, they are present with either hypocalcemia or with hypercalcemia and during the evaluation of hypercalcemia we get a lot of parathyroid adenomas so in order to tell about the biology as well as the assessment and management of hypercalcemia i kindly invite dr chandana who is our endocrinologist to come on stage and give a short talk about hypercalcemia and primary hyperparathyroidism dr chandana is uh, has done her uh, dm medical uh, endocrinology from the prestigious all india institute of medical sciences and has done her mbbs and md both from jipma so uh, dr chandana if you can hear me please i kindly invite you to come on stage and uh, give your talk on hypercalcemia thank you thank you dr sridhar good afternoon everyone uh it was a very good presentation of hemi thyroidectomy i've seen this after a long time post my mbbs it was nice watching it reminded me of my surgical rotation days so like we have a thyroid nodule and a patient presents to us with a nodule says there is a lump in the neck and we need evaluation they come with a multi nodular goiter or they come with a single nodule in the neck hyperparathyroidism parathyroid adenomas don't come to with a palpable nodules usually Usually we get them on a workup when we work up for hypercalcemia and then we find PTH elevated and then we do localization studies 
that's when we diagnose hyperparathyroidism and a parathyroid adenoma and then we go ahead with the surgery depending upon the criteria whether they are fulfilled or not. So, and again when you come to hypercalcemia, hypercalcemia has a varied presentation and most often it's asymptomatic and it's a biochemical uh, investigation which we find increased calcium level and then on finding increased calcium level when we work up we can find that yes there is something which is causing the increased calcium level. So we need to be really like when we know an increased calcium level we need to investigate it further, look for the causes and investigate it in a proper follow-up plan. So first let's look at the calcium homeostasis. In normal the CM calcium levels are monitored the Parathyroid hormone is the one which monitors it mainly along with the vitamin D and also calcitonin. So when there is a decrease in the serum calcium, the uh, parathyroid glands are stimulated and they increase the PTH which causes increased bone resorption and increased renal calcium reabsorption. And also in the kidney, the PTH causes the increased production of 125 dihydroxy vitamin D that causes increased calcium absorption from the GI tract. So all these cause the increase in the serum calcium level which in turn causes a reduction in the PTH. So this is the homeostasis which is normally maintained in the body. When there is a disruption in this, we can have like if the PTH levels are increased then they can cause an increased calcium levels. So let us look at the calcium normally. It is free calcium, ionized calcium is present in about 50 percent. The protein bond calcium is about 40 percent and complex with organic or inorganic is about 10 percent. This protein bound calcium is very important because in high albumin states like when there is a volume depletion or a patient has multiple myeloma, the calcium levels, the total calcium levels might appear too high but this is pseudo hypercalcemia and also in conditions like low albumin states like if the patient has malnutrition then the calcium levels are low. So in this state, usually the ionized calcium is normal. It's a total calcium which is abnormal. So whenever we look at the calcium levels, if we are looking at a calcium report, we always have to look at the serum albumin also, whether it's normal or not. And we have to look at the corrected calcium level, which is calculated as a serum calcium plus 0.8 into 4 minus the serum albumin of the patient. Now hypercalcemia is defined as corrected calcium more than 10.4 mg per dl or the ionized serum calcium which is more than 5.2 mg per dl. It is a common disorder and it accounts for about 0.6 of all acute medical admissions. Prevalence is also about 1 to 2 percent. The most common cause of hypercalcemia is either the primary hyperparathyroidism or malignancy which account for about 90 percent and Again, as we were saying, most commonly it is an asymptomatic presentation. It is detected by a chem on biochemical investigation. When you look at the clinical presentation, I think most of you know of this mnemonic, bones, stones, groans and psychic moans. So this is very good mnemonic which helps to identify the different features in which the hypercalcemia can present to us. And it is so vague. So a clinician, if a patient goes to the clinician, the clinician has to look for serum calcium in such situations just to rule out hypercalcemia. Like in the bones, the patient can go to an orthopedician with bone pain or fractures and sometimes the initial stages like earlier they used to have osteoarthritis fibrosa cystica where the bone was very thin and in, uh, in severe hyperparathyroidism. But in uh, it, uh, the orthopedician if they find some fractures which are abnormal then they should go and investigate for the calcium levels and work upon it. And also in, like we were in AIG, the most common presentation is patient coming with pancreatitis and on workup we find patient has hypercalcemia and we further work up and find uh, hyperparathyroidism. Uh, in your patient you can go to a urologist with renal calicli, renal colic, our urologist with CNS symptoms of confusion, depression, all the symptoms like it is like varied symptoms the patient can present and on workup only we can find out whether the patient has hypercalcemia. And when you look at the causes of hypercalcemia, they are quite varied. The most common being elevated PTH but other causes also there. 
So what we do is we look whether the PTH is elevated or inappropriately normal. Like when if there's a patient has hypercalcemia, then we expect the calcium, the PTH level to be suppressed. So if the PTH is normal in a situation of increased calcium level, that is also considered to be inappropriately high. So and the other group is when the PTH is suppressed. So with elevated or inappropriately normal PTH, the most common again is the primary hyperparathyroidism, rarely the tertiary hyperparathyroidism, a familial hypercalciuric hypercalcemia, we'll talk about it, lithium therapy and few genetic disorders. And with suppressed PTH, the most common cause is malignancy like lung, breast or hematological cancer, vitamin D excess which could be either intoxication or because of granulomatous diseases and other few rare causes like infantile hypercalcemia because of other endocrine disorders like paratoxicosis, adrenal insufficiency and drug induced. So when we are looking at a patient presenting with hypercalcemia, we need to take all this detailed history of drug intake, any other endocrine disorders and other situations in which it can be elevated. So the flowchart how we follow is once you get a report of hypercalcemia, first confirm. So confirming we will look at the ionized calcium or we look at the corrected serum calcium and if it is normal, most likely it's because of human concentration or because of some protein anomaly and if it is still elevated on a repeat test, if it is still elevated, we look at the clinical presentation and we look at the PTH levels also. The clinical presentation is suggestive of malignancy, then a workup for malignancy is done and also, the PTH is normal or high, so this is considered as a PTH-dependent hypercalcemia. And if it is low, it is considered PTH-independent hypercalcemia and we look for any occult malignancy in doing various studies like red chest radiograph or mammogramy or the CT scan, abdominal and chest and look for an occult malignancy. If nothing is found in spite of all the investigations, then they look for the other causes of PTH independent hyperparathyroid, hypercalcemia sorry and if malignancy is localized then management would be the treatment for the malignancy and maybe we can add on bisphosphonates for the controlling the hypercalcemia and let's look at PTH dependent hypercalcemia so if it is PTH dependent hypercalcemia it, as I was telling, there were multiple causes for that. So, we look at the 24-hour urine calcium and creatinine levels. If the urine calcium level is less than 100 mg per day or the clearance is also less than 0 0.01 and the PTH is normal and the patient is young with a family history of similar hypercalcemia in other relatives, then we should consider familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. So this is quite important. I'll talk to you about it later. later. So in this situation, we should consider this and just go for medical observation. If the PTH is elevated and if the, the urine calcium ratios are higher, then we should consider for primary hyperparathyroidism. This one entity, lithium therapy, in a, usually a psychiatric patient on lithium therapy, they also might present with mild hypercalcemia or with this increase, slightly increased PTH levels. This is because lithium increases the set point for PTH. So more calcium is needed to suppress the PTH levels. So the patient has mild hypercalcemia and also mild PTH levels increased. So in this condition, we should consider stopping the lithium therapy and look at it again if the calcium normalizes or not. So once a primary hyperparathyroidism is uh, diagnosed, we have a few investigations to be done in which one of them is bone densitometry and also we look at the criteria for surgery, whether the patient is fulfilling the criteria for surgery. Any patient of hyperparathyroidism is eligible for surgery unless contraindicated. But again, in that few patients can be managed on medical management or on surgical management if the patient has a mild hyperparathyroidism. So that uh, needs to be decided. So it's either medical observation or parathyroidectomy, which is a treatment of choice. Now coming to hypercalcemia, as I said, more than 10.4 is hypercalcemia. 
but in that also we have few grading like mild moderate and severe 10.4 to 12 is mild 12 to 14 is moderate and more than 14 is hypercalcemic crisis so if a patient comes with uh, mild hypercalcemia we usually hydrate the patient and monitor the patient nothing drastic measures are not taking and when it is between 12 to 14 again hydration is given and depending upon the patient's condition and the pth levels and expected further outcome we either go for further bisphosphonate or calcitonin i'll get to that but if a patient comes to us with hypercalcemic crisis we need to manage the patient immediately so usually we start with a hydration of 2 to 4 liters per day of uh, normal saline and then regarding furosemide the fures diuresis it should not be started right away it should be started only after rehydration in a dehydrated patient dehydrated patient the iv fluids are the primary treatment furosemide should be started only later maybe on day 1 or day 2 and the bisphosphonate pamidronate and zolinic acid can be given denizumab also works very well and uh, the injection calcitonin this can be given uh, like in the first 2 3 days more frequently at 12 hours or uh, daily interval but the problem is after 2 to 3 days the effect is reduced because of anaphylaxis uh, when you look at gallium nitrate uh, it's rarely used because it's toxic and glucocorticoids are mainly useful when it is because of vitamin d intoxication or because of granulomatous disease when there is a hypercalcemia in those conditions glucocorticoids are more useful diuresis again is when there is increased very high levels of calcium and the patient has concomitant renal failure or any other electrolyte dysfunction then that's when we go for diuresis so let's come to primary hyperparathyroidism the most common cause for primary hyperparathyroidism is adenoma which is seen in about 80 to 85 percent 10 to 15 have hyperplasia very rarely less than one percent is because of parathyroid carcinoma again adenomas are usually single adenomas but then there are few places times when they can be double mild adenomas or triple adenomas in rare situations so we need to have a look out for that localization studies help in that and as the size of the adenoma increases the patient usually has more symptoms and we have the situation called parathyroid hyperplasia where it's not just one adenoma the, all the glands are increased in size this is usually sporadic in about 75 percent and in 25 percent it's heritable the most common cause being men one syndrome and in men two syndrome also we can see uh, in such situations again we need to rule out familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia the hpt gt syndrome the hyperparathyroidism jaw tumor syndrome here this can have multiple parathyroid adenomas and most of them are malignant so we need to have a look at that and the neonatal severe hyperparathyroidism this is very rare and familial isolated hyperparathyroidism so these are the few uh, heritable familial hyperparathyroidism syndromes familial hypercalcemic hypercalcemia which i was saying it's very important because it's a uh, thing is when you diagnose a patient of familial hypercalcemic hypercalcemia we should avoid operating the patient because operating the patient and looking maybe thinking that the patient will going to remove, like if you just remove one gland the patient might continue to have hypercalcemia and if the surgeon is over enthusiastic and removes all the four glands the patient might go into hyperparathyroidism hypoparathyroidism which is not needed so this is usually autosomal dominant there's a slight increase in pth or sometimes the patient th levels are normal also this is mainly because there's a mutation in the calcium sensing receptor gene because of which there is a loss in the function of the calcium receptor and higher calcium levels are needed to maintain the uh, PTH levels and again the increase only slight and the urine calcium creatinine ratio this is very important in this diagnosis which is usually less than 0 0.01 as I was saying parathyroid carcinoma is very rare usually we can see the invasive growth there is an invasion in the vascular so, and even the perineural or into the adjacent soft tissue or into the thyroid tissue and most of these are solid growth pattern and they have nuclear pleomorphism and this is entity called normocalcemic pt phpt normocalcemic means the calcium levels are normal 
but the PTH levels are elevated. Usually, this is found when we are investigating a patient who is presenting with osteoporosis and the PTH levels are in elevated in this patient, but still the calcium levels are normal. So, in this case, patients also when we investigate further, sometimes we find an adenoma and we go ahead and treat that adenoma. So, once we diagnose a patient of hyperparathyroidism, uh, the investigations which need to be done, like first we need to look at the calcium levels and if the patient has earlier reports of calcium also, we will look at them and in young patients specifically, we look if there is a possibility of hypocalcuric hypercalcemia. The PTH, the assay usually is either the second generation or the third generation assay is preferred and as I was saying earlier, PTH can be normal, the abnormally normal PTH is also considered to be having hyperparathyroidism. 24-hour urinary calcium to rule out between PTH and FHH and also to look for any further development of renal complications. Uh, now coming to the vitamin D levels, we need to look at the uh, serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D because it helps to differentiate the FHH from mild PTH with a com component vitamin D deficiency because here there is a they both can have elevated PTH and calcium but they can have a normal to low 24 hour urinary calcium secretion. So this when you look at vitamin D deficiency so that's more likely a mild PTA PHPT and not FHH and also a secondary hyperparathyroidism due to vitamin D deficiency can be differentiated from the normal calcium PHPT like this when we look at the values of vitamin D. And in case we find a primary hyperparathyroidism with a vitamin D deficiency, we need to treat the patient so that the vitamin D levels are more than 20 nanogram per ml. And usually the treatment should be started at a slow, uh, slowly, it should not give high in dose vitamin D preparation so that the, the calcium levels don't increase drastically. Uh, when we look at the genetic testing, a genetic testing usually is not done in a patient of hyperparathyroidism. Occasionally, like I was saying, when we are looking at FHH, we can go and look for the calcium sensing receptor. And in case we are looking at a familial PHPT, we can look for the genetics like for MEN1 or MEN2 syndromes. See around creatinine levels, we look because more see how is the renal function and if the EGFR is less than 60 ml per minute that's also a threshold for which we decide whether the patient needs surgery or not. Renal imaging to look for any silent kidney stones which are usually seen in about 7 to 20 percent of patients. We usually do it with ultrasound and bone mineral density using a DEXA scan Usually, the cortical bones are affected in hyperparathyroidism. The forearm or the hip joints are more affected compared to the spine. And the more the bone loss, the more severe the hyperparathyroids. Vertebral fractures can also be seen in patients with hyperparathyroidism. Usually, they are uh, undiagnosed. So, usually, we look for an x ray in these patients. Serum phosphorus again is usually low or low normal in most of the patients with primary hyperparathyroidism and also in patients who have hypercalcemia due to malignancy. And some patients can also have hyperchloremic acidosis. So just to these are the, all the investigations which we do in a patient once diagnosed with hyperparathyroidism. Markers of bone turnover, again not normally done, but it can be done and it's usually on the upper end of normal or mildly elevated. Now, like these are the biochemical investigations which I was talking about and other few investigations which are done. But when we come to the localization, once we diagnose a patient has high PTH levels, we need to localize. We need to localize the adenoma or whether it's a hyperplasia or it's multiple adenomas. So the usual, the first line is ultrasound and then we go for the system AB or system AB spec and again 4D CT or MRI. All these investigations are the modalities of localization studies. Each has the ultrasound has a lesser sensitivity and specificity but the system AB and 4D CT are much better. So uh, the nuclear medicine consultant will be talking about it next. So once we diagnose and we have an adenoma 
what do we do should we go for a surgery or should we wait and do a medical management so the there are a few indications for surgery like if the patient has overt clinical manifestations like kidney stones or fractures or neuromuscular disease or symptomatic or life threatening hypercalcemia if the serum calcium is 1 mg per dl more than the upper limit of normal the creatinine clearance is less than 60 urinary calcium levels is more than 400 the bone mineral density is less than 0.25 or there's a vertebral fracture or history of fragility fractures young age and other uncertain prospects of adequate medical monitoring so like there's a wide spectrum of indications for surgery in a patient of primary hyperparathyroidism so in this situation surgery is the main modality of treatment there are few situations in which we can go for medical management when there is mild hyperparathyroidism the patient is elderly and the patient with the progression of the disease is also slow in that situation we can go for a medical management in which we monitor the serum calcium and creatinine annually and also the bone mineral density every 1 to 2 years and if we think that the bone progression the disease progression is occurring at a faster rate then we can proceed for surgery and in such an sudden conditions the all the patient is a high is uh, like he has poor uh, he has symptoms and he has high calcium levels and he has high pth levels but if the patient is a poor surgical candidate in such patients we can go for medical management so there are two medical managements which we normally do usually when there is a prior, patient has symptomatic or very severe hypercalcemia the calcium mimetic sinic acid is used and usually those who have more of osteoporosis the patient is treated with bisphosphonate and in few patients we give both sinic acid and also bisphosphonate there are few other drugs which are being given like denizumab and there are few investigation uh, investigational drugs like the calcitriol analogs and few drugs which block the pth receptor so just a last note so we are not having a surgery on parathyroid adenoma today uh, but in case we have a surgery before the surgery once the patient comes to us we need to optimize the hypercalcium levels a calcium level less than 12 mg per dl that is less than 3 mmol per liter is an acceptable pre calcium pre operative calcium level so if the patient comes to us with a calcium level of 14 or something like around 13 14 or more than, even more than that we need to reduce it to less than 12 for a better surgical outcome as we were talking earlier the infusion with normal saline is the first line of treatment in case the calcium levels are quite high then we go for bisphosphonates calcitonin a post cal um, saline diuresis infusion of phosphate or using uh, corticosteroids or gallium is rarely done usually in life threatening hypercalcemia hemodialysis can be used when there is a coexisting renal failure so once a patient is stabilized and the calcium levels are below 12 then the patient can go ahead for the surgery thank you thank you for a wonderful discussion about the hypercalcemia any questions from the audience no um i think uh, madam how do you manage these patients post op when somebody has got a calcium level of about 12 we operate and then what's the post op to management medical management so post op so usually what happens is in case we had initially treated the patient with zoronic uh, acid or bis or any other bisphosphonate post op this patient might go into hypocalcemia so that we need to look out for calcium levels monitor the calcium levels and sometimes we even give an infusion of calcium gluconate to um, monitor the calcium and then again if the patient had really severe uh, hyperparathyroidism that the pth levels were very high if the bone was very badly affected these patients can also go to hungry bone syndrome so we need to regularly monitor them look at their uh, alkaline phosphatase levels give them regular calcium supplement and manage them how long the patient has to stay in the hospital ma'am following this if somebody had develops a hungry bone syndrome uh it depends sir. some of them we would need an infusion for a few days like we had one patient whom we had given calcium gluconate infusion for one week 
and later we could change the patient on oral because the patient's calcium levels went drastically low. But most of the days, two to three days of infusion and then they can be changed to an oral medication. And then we'll be putting them on the calcium supplementation. Yes, calcium supplementation. Uh, generally, immediately post-surgical, what would be your first sample that you would draw to look at it, generally? We look at the PTH level, sometimes no, we even... What type do you usually draw your first sample for a calcium again after your parathyroid adenoma excision is over? The day one, we usually look at the day one, sir. Okay, oh. six hours proposed. Six well, hours, I, usually the day one. The next day is on. And uh, what is the protocol oh, you follow on, yeah. here for uh, PTH estimation? Do you send it uh, after better, injection, better. then intraop excision, then what type post excision that you would like to see? How much fall? Uh, I think intraop PTH monitoring is done here. No, no, no. Uh, but am I, am I audible? Uh, you are audible, sir. Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So actually, I think Madam is not the person. <laughs> we do have intraop PTH monitoring, sir. So we normally do. The first sample just before uh, the patient is taken into the OT. Yeah, we have uh, the first uh, PTH sample just before the patient is taken into the OT, and the second sample is done 15 minutes after the removal of the gland. And uh, we actually do uh, uh, even a intraoperative follow section to confirm whether what we have taken is actually the parathyroid or not, and even if it is a parathyroid, whether it, it contains a parathyroid adenoma or not. So we have had almost about 10 to 12 cases over the past one year, which I have been here, and we have had a success rate of 100%. So we have never had a, a misstep adenoma, or we have never had a, a double adenoma system. And uh, the follow-up is done by uh, normalization of the PTH with a fall of at least 50% uh, between the pre-excision as well as the pro-excision level. So there are various criteria, that is the Miami criteria, mains criteria, the one which is we, which we are using is the uh, drop of 50% from the preoperative PTH level and sustained PTH level which should be normalized that is at least less than 40 picogram per ml at the end of 6 months. So that is what we are following. So I think uh, the next uh, presentation was by Dr. Vishnu who is our nuclear medicine. Uh, I think Sridhar will give a, a, a very, th a, we are extremely indebted to Dr. Chandana for her disposition on the hypercalcemia. Thank you. Thank yes. you sir. Anyone is going to talk about hypercalcemia? About hypocalcemia, sir? Yeah. No, 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 we are not. Talk. We have a talk actually by Dr. Uh, Vishnu, who is our uh, nuclear medicine uh, consultant who has joined recently. But actually, I think we will do that uh, after the uh, commencement of the second theatre, sir. Okay. Because uh, right now the theatre is uh, completely uh, ready. So, yes, I think I was asked to present a bit about the positioning of the patient. So, if you can pan here. Yeah. So you can see that this is the uh, patient position. Patient is, this is the head end, this is the tail end. It is a complete extension with a sandbag between the interscapular regions of the shoulder. And some people also put a water bottle, that is a one liter bottle behind the, uh, especially patients who are short neck and have got a lot of fat in the uh, suprascapular region, they do put a water bottle. But this lady is young, she is a 26 year old female, recently married. She has got less amount of fat, so we just put a sandbag, head ring and we have got a neck extension. Second thing what you have to do is, we have to keep the head at an elevated level, at least 15 to 20 degrees of reverse Stendenberg. So the importance is number one, it takes in exposure and number two, it also prevents the venous drainage from going to the brain and therefore it is thought to reduce the amount of bleeding that is seen in the, uh, during the surgery. Second thing is the cautery settings, if you can just uh, pan here. So we have uh, all fo all forms of cautery settings. So this is our uh, lab uh, four strat system. So we use a low cautery setting. Right now it's actually 35 and 35. I will actually reduce it further to 30 and 30. And the mode that we use is for cutting. We use a pure pure mode. And for the fulgurate we use a 30 watts. That should be more than enough because this ensures that. We are able to get hemostasis while at the same time not uh, charring the tissues. And the third thing is right now what I am using. So I personally believe in loops and there are two or three surgeries where uh, I normally use a loop. This is a Carl system with a magnification of uh, 2.5x and a focal length of about 250, 350 millimeters. 
So the advantage of the 2.5x is that you do have a good amount of magnification, but at the same time you are also have a panoramic view, and the higher focal length, that is 350 millimeters, ensures that you do have a wider field of vision as compared to a compressed field of vision if the focal length reduces. So I am using a Carl Zeiss 350 mm focal length with 2.5x magnification. The other surgeries where I use uh, loops are one is obviously keratidectomy. And sometimes when I do a bladder uh, resection followed by a reconstruction with a helium conduit, for the ureterohelial anastomosis, I tend to prefer a uh, loop. So now, other system which right now we, we have a, a doctor, a gentleman, Mr. Harpreet, who has come with a system called as a Mediflex system. So this is an international system uh, which is something similar to our uh, self-retaining retractors. So it has got uh, two parts. One is known as the arm, which is called as the flex arm, and the flex arm can be tightened or loosened as per the orientation that we want. It is something similar to what is used in the neurosurgery. I think uh, that is called the Lila retractor. This is something similar to that. This is called as the flex arm, and wherever whichever position, whichever angulation, I think the light has to be turned on. Yeah, whichever angulation, whichever position you want it, you can just put it, and then you tighten it. And then it sits in that particular position. The second thing is this: what is it? What it is attached to? So this is known as a mini buckler. The buckler and the book holder retra retractors are commonly used in GI surgeries. Something similar is what can be used for head and neck surgeries. So again, this can be put up, can be put down, can be put close to each other, and can be put widened. So right now we are just keeping it here at the correct angulation that we want, and then we are going to tighten it. So the advantage of this system is that you actually can do the entire surgery with just one retractor and one single assistant staff nurse, right? And then you can just show me the blades once. Yeah. We have a series of blades. So this is a deeper blade. As you go deep into the tissues, this will be used more for retracting things in the deep, in the depth. And then we have superficial retractor similar to our small Langenbach retractors. So we have about three or four of these retractors and we have one which is a deep retractor. So this has got a system which is called as a ratchet system. So the ratchet goes along the the buckler or the book walter react, buckler uh, retractor and at whichever position you want kept inside. So you can just show it the, uh, Mr. Harpreet. Yeah. Now show, show how it went. We're just opening it up right now. We're setting it. Up. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So as you keep it here, it, it it stays here, and with the help of the self-retaining ratchet, it can be put in place. So as we are going out of the surgery, we will we'll keep demonstrating the same. And the second thing, what we have is the rubber bands. The rubber band system is something which is used like uh, in a lone star tractor. So we can just put the rubber band, use it for slap, uh, flap retraction and tighten it here. So I hope I am visible. It is very clear. Yeah. So we will we'll start ahead with the surgery. So this is the multinodular goiter. This is a big nodule. The big nodule which is present over the right side. This is actually the midline. It is better to mark the midline that is the chin as well as the suprasternal notch inferiorly. And then we can see the sternomastoid medial border here as well as the sternomastoid medial border there. There is also a nodule over the left lobe of the thyroid. These are the two main palpable nodules. The left palpable nodule, this is the isthmus and this is the nodule which is a large nodule of the right side. Regarding the incision, so normally the incision which is, there is a lot of debate and a uh, lot of literature about the type of incision that we have to give. Most of the time, this is asked in a lot of exams also, what is the incision that is given? The incision that is regularly given is known as the Cocker's incision, which is given by named Dr. Emil Theodore Cocker, who was actually the Nobel Prize laureate. He's one of the few surgeons who has actually got a Nobel Prize in the field of medicine because of the amount of work he did in the field of uh, thyroid surgery, to make thyroid surgery safe and simple. So, normally what is done is two finger breath above the suprasternal notch at the most prominent crease. And based upon 
patients if the patient has got large breasts they say that you put the incision slightly cranially because it is going to be retracted down as the scar keeps on maturing so all these things nowadays we are not doing at least at our institute we actually see which is the most prominent skin crease which is available in this particular female so in patients who have got a lot of neck fat there are multiple creases but this lady is actually quite thin so there, there is going to be one or two major creases at the level of the chin and the neck the junction this is the level where she is going to get the maximum amount of creasing so the skin crease is actually going to be placed here and i'm sure raju sir also will appreciate it because we have learned this from him the only disadvantage if you could say one is that because there is a large inferior flap and a shorter cranial flap we have to increase the incision length so that is one thing which may have to be done especially if this particular nodule has to come up into the surgical field so it's a bit of a struggle to especially for securing the lower pole but since the nodule is completely mobile and it will be having i assume it's going to have only a few amount of soft tissue attachments to the strap muscles as well as the investing layer of deep cervical fascia i think we should be able to get away because she is very young she is going to have start for the rest of not just lift the patient up and area where the scarring is where the scar formation is going to take place so we have already done that and we have found that this is where the this is scar right so i think the lights can be turned on and the second thing actually regarding uh, parathyroidectomy so a lot of uh, literature goes into the moment people see a parathyroid adenoma the first thing you'll ask is for go for a vitamin d level estimation yes a vitamin d level estimation is important but one should remember that we are actually not going to treat the hyperparathyroidism we are going to treat the hypercalcemia and no amount of hypovitaminosis or vitamin d deficiency can ever cause hypercalcemia so it can only contribute to the parathyroidism hyperparathyroidism so if the parathyroid elevation may be due to vitamin d along with the actual native parathyroid i know so that's the only thing the most important thing is to track the calcium level and once you get the normalization of the calcium with a normalization of the pth level i think that is when you stop your surgery so i think we'll start off with the surgical excision Uh, we have always uh, thought about why always to figure but about the uh, sternal lodge and why not about Start because uh, the whenever you do a flap Suction. you tend to struggle to identify the superior pole always inferior pole and lower part of the thyroid is never a problem it is never a problem it is just the delivery especially when it is non malignant multi nodular you can just deliver it out outside So I think uh, we always had this why always two septa, and this makes more sense because reaching to the upper pole is far more easier when you go into a crease which is higher compared to the uh, place where you're trying to take up the whole flap from just below two centimeters to uh, reach it to your higher pole. This makes uh, the exposure of upper pole far more easier. Uh, second, uh, when you look at it, usually it is not uh, the nerve is not at the lower pole. That is what you are supposed to. but nerve is at the sides not at the lower so i think the incision put anywhere at the prominent crease still uh, justifies the way you are going to do it suction suction actually we do it only and i uh, felt very happy to see the picked up this trick because this gives uh, by far the best cosmosis to the lady and especially in the young ladies who have a more pendulous breast with the conventional incision there will be dragging of the scar to the suprasternal notch making this scar very ugly and with this kind of approach to practically you won't see a scar after 6 months and delivery of the inferior pole is not difficult just to push it up from the upper benign tumor so for benign conditions like multi node lock right so right now we have Given the incision at the level of skin and down at the platysma level, so as has been told previously that the platysma is not well developed at the center, so we try to identify the platysma bit laterally. So I feel that this these steps 
especially the use of a loop is extremely easy because there will be some amount of blood loss at the level of the platysma also and the platysma does get its blood supply from the branches uh, sometimes from the branches of the facial artery itself and sometimes in especially bulky patients it can be extremely okay so you can see here yeah in bulky patients the platysma may be extremely well vascularized extremely thick so once you go to the level of the platysma try to get cells over the dermal dermal area because otherwise it will keep on irritating you during the duration of the surgery either some focusing is required yeah. there so be at that sir uh, regarding the incision dr ajay here yeah. regarding the incision so i always used to wonder where dr sridhar picked up the thing about uh, putting an incision so high uh, because uh, so i have also changed my practice especially for uh, yeah. larger Which lesions please? smaller lesions i still I go with the focusing finger breath lesion but please? as dr arvin pointed out we definitely in the because uh, that is where sometimes you have to struggle with the retractions but are you happy with incision yes yeah hold it hold this yeah i would be little apprehensive no, when i think I there is a loss of focus uh, go in go deep dissection yeah, yeah. Something now it's fine now it's fine when you are okay. because you will have to go straight is, is the visuals are the, the visuals better now sir correct the incision size increases a little yeah, much better sir yeah much better okay basically you tend to uh, trace both your recurrence until it enter into the superior mediastinum so you are looking at that part that part becomes slightly difficult when you uh, tend to do a higher incision but Two still it is doable because you don't have the thyroid when you are doing your nodal dissection so you have enough space to address this and go down as much as possible. so you can see some branches from the going for the platysmal blood supply supplying from the yeah anterior jugular so these actually have to be dropped on to the flap the flap has to be free of these so even if they are seen no problem again a second trick which i picked up sometimes especially when you are having bulky patients i do tend to prophylactically ligate the anterior jugulars So there is a lot of discussion regarding it causes lymphedema, flap edema. So personally, I have not seen it actually, and especially when you are having large tumors. Yeah. So I think my hand is coming the way. Yeah, I'll try to. Yeah, is it better now? Yeah. So once you get the flap, the importance of this high incision is you don't need to go very high. This is because most of the pole is most of the thyroid is actually in the lower aspect, right? So now I think we can use the retractor. Can you give me the? No, no. Can you give me the? Uh, yeah, rubber bands. Yeah, hooks. Yeah, the soap. So you are you using this uh, this equipment routinely? Sir? No, sir. This is actually this is actually for demonstration. demonstration. I have used it for one particular case previously, okay. and I found it it is quite good. We are we yeah, the uh, we might purchase it, sir. Okay. So how expensive is it? Yeah, the entire thing i think is about 12 lakhs sir okay depending upon what there are multiple modes which are available true you can use it for the artery forceps yeah give artery forceps yeah so this is like what we use for yeah, our the lone star retractor yeah lone star retractor in fact we do have a similar thing for the abdominal part also yeah yeah the same thing he said also so right now you can see there is no need for any retraction and uh, the entire you know the pole at least for the flap part is free so now we'll go to the lower pole so now get me the skin hooks skin hooks no, not this not this skin hooks so this is going to be a little bit dicey because we have as you can see that the thyroid is quite low down i have to raise significantly long lower flap Let's go.
Sir, you do a hemithyroidectomy. Do you put your uh, incision in the midline or you... No, I you want it to be very symmetrical. Yeah. There are some people who believe in symmetry and no. They say lesser incision, less effect. But uh, I think majority believe in taking that symmetrical incision. The star symmetrical is also beautiful. Uh, when we are making this kind of an incision for these patients, uh, the, fla the flap -like technique would be difficult. So you have to raise the flaps. So the trick is to raise the plane. Most of the budding surgeons, including me, myself, uh, we don't actually deal in the platysma properly during the initial stages. So because you don't deal in the platysma properly, we tend to go in a deep subplatysmal plane. We tend to go in a supraplatysmal plane, and that lands up in all forms of uh, trouble. So the trick is you have to catch the platysma, and once you identify the platysma all around, you have to stick to the undersurface of the platysma. Giving as some, far as well. giving some traction to the skin by the assistant would also yeah. help in uh, creating the plane. Yeah. Yeah. Get me the platysma. So, as you go deeper down, is to switch from the get me one more retractor remove this one one more retractor so as we go deeper down you have to go deeper into the tissues this is a place where most of the time there is an injury to the anterior veins The trick is to see the veins, be, raise the flap on either side of the vein and uh, tackle the vein level of platysma last so that uh, you don't have to. Most of the time, an unactivated part, if you just depress the vein, you will be able to see the direction of the vein going and you will be able to get it out without uh, injuring the vein. So regarding the uh, parathyroids again, so we have an extremely competent and you know, dare I say one of the best nuclear medicine departments in the city. Uh, we have actually never had a situation wherein which we could not actually identify the preoperatively. So a spec scan by making use of system EB, we have always been able to locate the position of the uh, parathyroid. Even small parathyroids less than one centimeter in which it is thought that the functional imaging is not that good. Uh, even then, we have been able to pick it up. There has been one particular case in which it was about a mediastinal parathyroid adenoma, suspicious, for which we had to go for a 4D CT scan. And right now, at that time, it was not available here, but right now, we also have the technique for 4D CT. So, I think Dr. Arvind was asking regarding for choline, choline scan. Yeah. yeah, I so had we, a particular yeah. case where it was not picked up on technetium 99, yeah. but choline pet picked it up. Yeah, so choline pet right now is not available, but uh, most of the time, even you know, the exact localization is given by Dr. Sunita, Dr. Mohan Group. Uh, we don't have actually, we have a very good team that way. And we are also, we have one pet CT scan right now, and uh, I think by the next month end, our second pet CT function. So we have two of everything right now. We have two MRs, two CTs, and two PET CT scans right now at age. Uh, from next month onwards, two of our robots also are going to, going to start functioning. So I think you raise the flap. We can see that as the length of the incision has increased, it has been easy for me to raise the flap. So from above, I'm not sure it's it's not possible to see, but we are actually reached the. We have and we are almost below the clavicle. Yeah. Because of the autofocus issue. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the this is the thyroid, this is the trap muscle, this is the nodule, and yeah. Okay, it's not there. Still not visible. Now is it visible? Not visible. Still not visible? Not visible. Okay. Yeah. 
I think it's not visible. Basically, for me, I can definitely see that I have reached the lower pole of the thyroid, and that is what we should be realizing that the presence of the high incision is, a, is not going to really hamper the elevation of the thyroid. So now, what we will do is, yeah. So we'll put a couple of the rubber bands down as well. Just remove it. So the advantage is that you have you can keep on placing multiple rubber bands. The trick is that you have to identify at each level what retractor to use. So this is in the cutaneous plane. It's better to use the rubber bands as we are in the platysmal plane. And we can use one more here and one more. Here. Again, these have got a low. They don't cause crushing. And one more here. So reasonable exposure, but still a bit difficult. But let us see. So give me one re regular retractor now. So the regular retractor is behind here. Yes. yes, like this. Okay. Now Another the trick in the lower flap is actually to uh, identify the sternocleidomastoid oh. and stay between the flap and the sternocleidomastoid. Oh. At least for big, that is a trick uh, yeah. that you can oh. use. So again, identifying the bitten, leave it now. Leave it now. So when you have large glands, you can see that there is a splaying of the strap muscles. The, splash, the strap muscle on the right side is splayed, it is stretched, something similar is there on the left side. So in that time, the midline opens up quite well. It is in small glands like how Dr. Varun did in the morning, where identification is going to be difficult. Second thing is normally they see that the anterior jugular veins have to be on either side of the midline. But when there is a growth of the nodule more on one side, there is a ten tendency to for the anterior jugular veins to shift. So in my particular case, the anterior jugular veins are towards my side, so I'll open the strap on the opposite side. Hold it, Amma. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Yeah, and you keep on progressing up now. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. So I think there is a lot of communication above. Yeah. Hold this. Back up this. So one has to. Adjust to what the body is giving you. We cannot come with a prefixed mindset that today it's going to be easy. Today's workshop, so we have to get a very laddu case. We have to adjust to what God gives us. Hold. Yeah, I think this is crossing. I like it. It. Okay, get me a mosquito or get me a 3 0 vehicle on needle. If something is coming in our way, I just I think that there is no point. It is going to cross the midline here, it is going to cause a lot of bleeding. We just get it out. 3 0 vehicle on needle. So you can see there is a vessel going here, there is a vessel going there. You take a bite. Will be there. Right here. Ready? Sir, do you tend to use? Ultrasound for parathyroid just before, or you tend to leave it to the radiologist that they mark it for you. No, most of our cases are parathyroid edumomas. They are either systematically scanned or scanned and identified, and uh, preoperative ultrasound. Intraoperative ultrasound, I don't have any experience personally. Do you have I, any experience? No, sir. I did it. I usually try to correlate what they have done in the uh, radiology department. Maybe two, three cases I have been through. You are fairly able to identify. Especially I started after uh, you guys started isolating the inguinal nodes for ICG. So it's increased yeah, no. to the... Uh, What's your experience with the ICG? For the Great, sir. Beautiful. Great. Uh, you just give it in the inguinal node. You see it on the table. 
no issues at all with that and i am very very comfortable that and identify for us okay. i'm talking about the parathyroids parathyroids you are able to identify provided you see them prior in the radiology because they have to isolate it for you first then you go ahead uh, uh, isolating the same thing on table but uh, what is the trick is you as a surgeon has to work up looking at it once you have seen the technetium you mark the technetium then you go back to the uh, radiology room uh, you be there personally put it into extension because you are going to see your patient on an extension you mark it prior before uh, you do so you work a lot before you take it to the operating room and unless you don't uh, mentally make a preparation for seeing it somewhere yeah, high chances you will lose it and you will have to open up whole place to see once you have localized the parathyroid uh, small incisions are enough to achieve or yeah. i think you are talking about radio colloid yeah, i'm um, talking about the radio colloid but and you are asking about icg icg in the parathyroid it is usually when you give icg and it is usually the first one to light up but then for that you have to have the whole that we put it especially in uh, so i think uh, Correct. But other thing is regarding uh, the probe, uh, the parathyroid gland actually having a fluorescence of its own that yeah. I have not noticed. That is described in some art articles. It's described. Yeah. Yes, that's why I don't have much of an experience <laughs> with that. Experience. I don't have any experience, sir. So actually, uh, we used that uh, system, sir, the Carl Stoll system, when it was in demo mode. Hmm. So we tried to use the auto fluorescence. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, uh, <laughs> we could not make it out, sir. No, because had, uh, some yeah. other person has commented in the same way that he didn't find any advantage. With yeah, that. no, actually in Delhi, I think there is a, in Rajiv Gandhi, they're routinely doing apparently. Okay. Because our plastic okay. surgeon told that they routinely used to do with autofluorescence. But to be honest, uh, autofluorescence, plastic surgery is okay, but I'm talking about specific to the parathyroid. No, 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 he, he was working in plastic surgery, okay. but his, uh, the, the team used to do it for uh, parathyroid Parathyroids. adenomas. Okay. So he said that why don't you try it and so that's why when they came with the open system okay. for a demo mode so we tried using it but uh, probably we have gained some experience yeah uh, i have a system with 680 nanometer okay. i so uh, convert okay. it to a dark room use the lab system to look at it I think that uh, penetrance is not good with the lab system no. so i don't think things. you will and you want that uh, uh, open system which has a overlay mode I think that would help in identifying because mine I couldn't identify after giving the yeah. IV. Uh, we have both the lab and the open system. Open system. One of my colleagues tried it and he was not very happy, but yeah. it was still in the early phases. Which is very true, sir. Actually, the lab system doesn't work well for open. Probably something to do with external light or something. So once you darken yeah. the whole room and then focus only the lab system, probably then. But still, it's not as good as the open system for open. But people doing minimal access thyroidectomies are regularly using ICG to identify the parathyroid. That is the same when uh, the field is there. That is the first one to light up actually. Yeah, I think there are yes, other sir. other things. Methylene blue also they say, sir, one liter you can give methylene blue in one liter of uh, normal saline, and uh, the area which does not pick up the methylene blue is thought to be the parathyroid. So that is another system which you can methylene blue into the IV rather than local. So, and second is, yeah, the differential vascularity of the and ICG I know system. There is two different protocols. One is mm -hmm. to see the vascularity oh, no, for the parathyroid, oh, no. which, is different, which is given IV. And the one where there is a low dose, where you pick up first uh, yeah. this. That is what the company claims, but I have never seen it. Okay. Hold the channels. So you can see that the lower pole I'm separating out from the uh, strap muscles. So you can see that it's quite easy with the current incision as well. Not much of difference. So what happens is this big gland sometimes internal jugular vein comes a bit medial. So you have to continuously keep on repositioning the yeah. Give me one bipolar ma. What is it? Can the right side up, please? So this is another trick which uh, is commonly done. So as you are doing the right side, you keep going into a tunnel. So is my, yeah, my hand is there. coming. My hand is coming. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, my hand is. Coming. Yeah, fine. Now is it better? Now right it's side better. Up. Now right it's side up. Yeah. 
right side up. So the second thing trick is to put the right side of the, the ipsilateral side, whichever you are operating, that's enough. So you, you just lift the table up, so that opens up the area of interest, both for the audience as well as for the surgeon. So you can see that, yeah, it can yeah see. it's a bit visible, yeah, give me the bipolar foot switch. So I'm consciously trying to, you know, not like this. Salain Vayam. This is a mode, 30. Standard mode or micro mode. So, few fibers, gauze piece. Strap muscles completely, still the lower part of the strap muscle is here only. Once that is separated, I will try to reposition the, no, my, your hand is coming the way, put it here. I can put it here, 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 I can put it here. So what Sridhar is asking yeah. the assistant is to hold the yeah, yeah. pole with one yeah, finger. Yeah, that's it. See that he is not asking them to retract with any instruments, it's a very key component here. Instruments, yeah. you will have bleed there. The right. finger is the best retractor for this yeah. kind of maneuvering. Yeah. So we have completely separated the strap muscles. Okay, now you can, uh, Mr. Harpreet, I am relieving you. Kindly get me the deep, deep retractors. Which one? No, not that one. The other one. So once the straps are, yeah, that one. Get me two of those. So at each step you have to continuously uh, reposition the retractors. That is the time consuming part of this system, but uh, I think it can be still useful. So once this is there here, yeah, you, you set it up first. Yeah, so fine. Yeah. So retract more please, yeah, you're retracting more, yeah. So as you are retracting more, the lower pole is getting pulled up. So this one, this, yeah. yeah, so just remove your hand amounts, now try to pan up a bit, go a little bit upward, no, no, it's not, it's not held this trap, it's not held this trap, yeah, now do it, yes, that's it. Leave it alone, leave it alone. Yeah, okay, fine. So, this is the thing. Okay. Give straight arteries some straight hospitals for me. Make easy, I think. So, I think uh, different methodologies can be used for different people. Uh, most of the time, people go from superior pole, then go to the mid pole, and then finally the lower pole. I generally try to go to the mid pole first. So, two arteries or mosquitoes over the mid pole. Straight arteries are good, tend to not shear that much. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Give me mosquito arm now. So the, no, this is interfering. Okay. So a bit of this. I get a smaller one. No, oh, it's interfering. This one? Yeah. Put that. Put it more. Yes, 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 yes. Leave it. Yeah, leave it. Leave it. Okay, fine. So now you have seen this. Fine. Excellent. This one has not come here actually. Mm. So are you opening a problem? Amisha. No, you open it. What I said. Last time. Ha. Dalu under. Niche dalu. Ha. Niche dalu. Ha. Just. Abhi karo. Karo. बस नरों को मत कीजो हाँ बस फाइन ओके सो फिर गिम आस्की तो सो वी कैन सी दैट वी आर डन विद दी पैरा कैरोटिड डिसेक्शन वंस वी आर डन विद द पैरा कैरोटिड डिसेक्शन द नेक्स्ट थिंग इज़ टू आईडेंटिफाई दी लोरिस ट्रायंगल सो वेर इज़ द लोरिस ट्रायंगल लोरिस ट्रायंगल इज़ बाउंडेड मीडियम 
laterally by the carotid and then inferiorly by the inferior thyroid artery. So you have to catch the inferior thyroid artery first. So most likely this may be the inferior thyroid artery. So the nerve will be at the junction of the three. Okay. So we'll enter here. The few sub fibers are still there. We'll have to separate them first. So am I audible? Yeah, it's very clear. Yes. But the images are very nice. Yeah. So now we will again reposition this retractor. So every time you go to one particular place, you have to continuously reposition the retractor. Nikalu. Some still fibers of this strap are there. Because of that, we are having problem. Is there someone? Scissors, scissors. Don't, don't, don't stop. Tissue cutting scissors, huh? So I think now we are into the, we can actually dissect the Loris triangle, dissect this nicely, yeah, okay. So this will be probably the location, this is the inferior thyroid artery, this, is it visible, it is not visible, can show me this, yeah. So here you will see the fat, which will, no, it is not visible, yeah, focusing issue is there, yeah, okay. Now it is better. Yeah, okay. So this is the inferior thyroid artery. The inferior thyroid artery supplies the blood supply to both the superior as well as the inferior parathyroids. This is the main trunk of the inferior thyroid artery. Okay. So just medial to that will be the trachea and lateral to that will be the carotid. This is the carotid. This is the carotid pulsations. Right? Can you see? Can you see the carotid pulsations? Yeah, we can see the carotid. Okay. So in this triangle will be the regular neurogen nerve. So go slowly. Is this? Is this? Now? Yeah, we can see a cord like structure there. Yeah, this going one. in oblique fashion. This is an oblique fashion. Yeah. This is now. Yeah. So actually this may not be the inferior thyroid. Yeah, it's this a, is a vein. It is very so close to the inferior yeah, pole. pole. This is a vein. Yeah. This is the inferior thyroid artery, the pulsation here. Yeah. So we can safely ligate this. Yeah. Give me a right angle. 
So the trick is obviously to look for pulsations. So this is not pulsating. So this is most likely three three zero. Always use the least uh, dimensions of the suture material. Either three zero, no, no, three time, three zero y zero silk. Because you are glowing close to a lot of nervous uh, nervous structures, you can cut that micro and give it up. You can cut that micro back end and give it up. This is one of the lateral veins. Uh, one yes. of the either uh, middle hip, sorry, middle hip, sorry. Uh, Yes, thyroid vein. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes then. the middle thyroid seen in at least fifty percent, fifteen to fifty percent, yeah. and most of the time is seen on one side. It is bilateral. So that is the anatomy, and they drain directly to the internal jugular vein. So again, you can ligate it as close to the thyroid as possible. The adage that go to the thyroid when you are in doubt is true. But this is the advantage of the loop. So the loop allows you good amount of magnification. Give me a clip, Pama. Good amount of magnification, and it helps you to see bleeders before they are resistant. So give me one more clip. The only thing with the loop is I I find it that it reduces the speed at which you do surgery. Sometimes you tend to go much faster because the panoramic view is much better without a loop. Got it. Let me force it. Ask you to. So you can see now again. Now we can go close to the thyroid, close to the gland, bipolar. Try to separate the inferior pole. We have seen the inferior thyroid artery, and then we saw the cord-like structure that is the RLN. So anything above that, go close to the thyroid gland, with the off chance that there may be some. ectopic parathyroid tissue some gentle sweeping actions liberal use of saline especially if you have used this bipolar for a long period of time sometimes it tends to char and some of times has a amount of lateral spread as well the next Once you see these two structures, you can actually go to the lower pole, right angle, which is end. So for this, yes, pull it. Sometimes you have to be careful close to the lower pole. Yes. Because along the thyrothymic ligament, you get the thyroid. Yeah. Bipolar. Did you identify the inferior parathyroid? No, sir. I'm just. Once I see the okay. lower pole, I'll just come here once. Last piece of chest. Give me a mosquito. The so general location of the inferior parathyroid is it is located inferior to the RLN and dorsal to the RLN, whereas the superior parathyroid is located cranial to the RLN and ventral to the RLN. So we can see here this part. Let's just come. You can just lateralize this a bit. My problem. Is this? So definitely, we can see the nerve here. That is the nerve. Yeah. Can you see this, sir? Yeah. 
Yeah. Can you feel the structure? Yeah, we can see. Yeah, that is got a capsulated structure, encapsulated. This is the RLN. This is the inferior thyroid artery. And this is the inferior parathyroid. So it yeah. gets its step supply from the base. The inferior thyroid artery gives a branch to the inferior parathyroid and then it splits up again and travels cranially. So once you see the nerve here, we just go close to the thyroid gland. So once you identify the inferior parathyroid gland in the normal location, it will be very easy and you can do in a faster way the dissection of the lower pole. Yes. So you can use clips liberally actually. This point small bezels will be there and the post operative will open up. Use small amount of clips. Bipolar. Salen, salen. Scissors. So once we are here, we do what is known as intracapsular dissection. Once we there, keep always a look on the RLN, where the RLN is. This is the RLN again. The RLN. Okay, let's get to you. As a muscle. This is a parathyroid, this is the RLN, this is some accompanying vein. I think we have nicked a small vein somewhere down. Is this? Just put it for some time. This is a okay, Now we'll separate the lower pole from here. So the inferior thyroid veins come at a parallel access to the thyroid gland as compared to the inferior thyroid artery which most of the time is perpendicular. Bipolar you Small, small vessels. Salani.
So you can see we have reached the trachea here. Once you reach the trachea, scissors on scissors on the chair. Okay. So we are done with the lower pole, most of it, okay. So again reposition, check where we are, again the parathyroid here, don't, don't, don't stop, don't stop. And clearly see this probably is a node this looks like a node this is the parathyroid this is a small node we can leave it and that is the RLM bipolar RLN, we keep going immediately. It tends to branch out. It gives branches to the larynx. It gives branches to the esophagus. It also gives branches sometimes medially. I hope it's visible, sir. No, uh, Sridhar, as yeah. I think I'll ask the cameraman to focus on the recurrent laryngeal now because yeah. this is a critical component here. Yeah. This is the RLM. Uh, that's like much better. Yeah. Can, this is the RLM. Yeah, let him be uh, keep that still there. Yeah. As you carry, as you are carrying out the dissection, we can see the yeah. inferior thyroid artery arching around, giving a loop to the superior thyroid artery. Scissors. Yeah. Okay. You can see it's almost yeah, entering the cricothyroid here. Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So from here, the branch will come to the superior parathyroid. Yeah. This is the common vein which goes over the very ligament. And I think I've nicked it here. Yeah. Okay, bipolar. Perception. A small vein here settled. So you can see here, if I'm not mistaken. So now is almost entering into the cricothyroid here. So, right. so in this fat, cranial as well as dorsal, you will find the superior parathyroid.
अब हम लेट सी है रिपोजिशन दिस अगेन सो नाउ वी आर लिफ्ट समय लीजिए ना कैसा करेंगे इसको थोड़ा ऊपर कर लेंगे हाँ नहीं नहीं ये वाला करो ना हाँ हाँ थोड़ा ऊपर करो हाँ हाँ क्या फाइन करो मत करो इसका डालो ये नीचे नहीं आता था ये ऐसा ट्विस्ट नहीं होता था हाँ ओके ओके ट्विस्ट नहीं छोटे छोटे ये ऊपर करो हाँ यस अभी करो हाँ एक मिनट एक मिनट छोड़ो 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 या कर या फाइन नॉट लॉकिंग हाँ हाँ इधर लॉक में हाँ अभी करो हाँ थिंग फोकसिंग अगेन गॉन हाँ पल रही सभी सो नाउ वी गो सुपीरियर पोल सो द एडवांटेज रिमूव द मिड पोल ट्रेस इट कंप्लीटली देन द सुपीरियर स्पेस होल्ड इट लाइक दिस हैंड शुड नॉट कम इन होल्ड इट लाइक दिस या सो फ्यू फाइबर्स ऑफ द स्ट्रैप्स So this is the so-called Joule triangle. So the Joule triangle is formed by the trachea. The roof is formed by the strap muscles, and laterally it is formed by the superior laryngeal vessels. In that, along the medial boundary, you will find the space of ribs, and in that you will find the superior laryngeal nerve. so the superior laryngeal vessels divide into upper as well as lower divisions the upper pole sometimes can go very high so you have to ligate it close to the superior pole Sarnia has come up with a classification system. Give me one more for the relationship of the superior laryngeal nerve with the superior pedicle. So type one is when it is more than two centimeters above the superior pole. Type two is between. so this is probably the anterior division of the superior pole half please yes. this it this some amount of thyroid tissue is there but it's okay especially when you are doing for a benign indication at least hard visuals okay Visuals are good.
of click okay okay show it immediately last piece some last piece mosquito so now we will try to trace the superior laryngeal nerve this is a cri this is one of the branches again part of the strap here bipolar antan padam monopolar So can you see mosquito? Yeah. Hmm. Seven random. So can you see sir we can see that yeah so that is a cord like structure that is the superior laryngeal nerve external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve so it's going medially okay so now we'll go to the posterior division of the superior thyroid artery here in this area will be where you find the parathyroid so go medially that's all bipolar am salen and This is the angulation made by the superior thyroid, superior laryngeal nerve, and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So this will be at an angulation like this, and the superior laryngeal nerve will be at an angulation like this. So some of something about a 150 degree angulation is commonly maintained between the superior laryngeal nerve as well as the recurrent laryngeal nerve. I think uh, while we are proceeding, we can probably invite Dr. Vishnu to give his talk on the role of imaging. I think let the superior pole be completed when we are going to the other side. Okay, sir. That's, I think that should be better. Yeah. I think. So they will be seeing at least one side completely. Okay, monopolar only. Yeah, fine. Excellent. Lift up, lift up. So you can see that there is a not much amount of action which is required because we have freed up the mid pole first. Otherwise, normally, 
it becomes very problematic when you go for the superior pole first and both the nerves are in your field here is the RLN here is the SLN and everything in between you can cut provided you identify the superior parathyroid so monopolar Your hand is coming over. So we have freed the superior pole completely. You can see the now very beautifully. Yeah, we can see the yeah. external laryngeal now very clearly yeah. there, running. Yeah. Down. And now, we can see the inferior parathyroid here. Superior parathyroid, I think we are not. Suction yeah. genome. Yeah. So once you are superiorly as well as inferiorly completely free, and then we go for medial section. Go medially. You get a few branches. What is bleeding there? Okay. Yeah. 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 Once you immediately attach it, detach it, strap. All you are left then is with the very segment. Again, lateral this. Silent this. Fine. Now, show me this angulation. So now we can see clearly. This is the nerve. This is, I think, part of the nodule which is overhanging the so-called tubercle of Zucker candle. I think there is a nodule in that particular location as well. So give me a clip. These are the vessels which are going to the gland, distal to the supply to the inferior parathyroid clip you want give me bipolar knife please knife 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 Okay, so you can see that the nerve is going into the cricothyroid junction. This part is a nodule which is overhanging, and as Dr. Rajus has already said previously, there is a small twig which directly crosses the berry segment, and this is the area where it commonly bleeds. We have to be careful here, separate it properly. Mosquito disco. And this is where a clip comes very handy. Let's clip it once. The rest of this clip on. Clipped up, bipolar, saline nicely, nice saline score. So there may be some lateral spread even with the presence of a bipolar. Large amount of saline should be present. Yeah. That is good. Right, this is the now align, please. 
ಕೈನೆಲೆ ಬಿಟ್ಟು So I reached the trachea here and laterally. The last remaining structure is this part. The condensation of the pretracheal fascia, so called deris ligament. Posterior medial to the trachea, anterior lateral to the, posterior medial to the thyroid, anterior lateral to the trachea. That condensation of the pretracheal fascia constitutes the deris ligament. The mosquito. Again, small twigs which are crossing, better to buzz them, tackle them, otherwise they tend to bleed a lot. Lucky that here there is not much of clean this one. Just a question to the panel, sir. So, uh, just for the sake of the audience, so what investigations do we do after a total thyroidectomy immediately after surgery? Uh, so, once you have done, just to make sure that uh, the parathyroid function is intact, do you routinely do a calcium or do you do a PTH also? How do you manage? What is your practice on that? Usually, we don't monitor PTH on a regular basis is just a day two calcium that we measure and look for the symptoms and signs so that's the routine thing uh, that's our routine practice is to follow the symptomatology and then day two or day three get the calcium done no pth yeah yeah after uh, 48 hours that is post second day i tend to do just a serum calcium and albumin for corrected calcium and that's it we are done it is What's a practice your here as What's well. Your, your same. Yeah, it's same practice, but I've seen some surgeons doing uh, PTH level as well. But uh, what uh, they have seen is sometimes it's falsely low, even though the patient does not have hypocalcemia or uh, any symptoms. So checking uh, PTH routinely usually may not be useful. Most of the centers won't have that facility first. It's not available most of the places except the major centers. And it doesn't add much value unless you are suspecting uh, the patient is not recovering from the hypocalcemia with the supplementation. I think Madam is there, Dr. Chandana, uh, regarding the utility of the PTH, uh, no value. It's not working. Um, uh, this is one experience from a center which I went to observe robotic thyroidectomies. So they regularly used to do PTH on day one and most of these patients had a low PTH. We did not know the reason. But calcium used to come normal. Most of them would go without symptoms. We do it's not know because of the nemo period. Two minutes nemo that is created, if that has an effect. No, because of the transient. One second. Keep it like that. It's a good center. It's a. No, because yeah, of yeah, transient is yeah, yeah, as matter will be transient that is very parathyroidism yeah, also. Yeah. But at the end of six months, what they show is the actual rates of. Trans, uh, permanent hypoparathyroidism, even in a auto transplanted uh, parathyroids, is about 3 to 4 percent. Whereas in auto transplanted uh, parathyroid, case, 
the chances of transient hypoparathyroidism is to the tune of 40 to 50 percent so it's only in the early phase but on a routine basis will it really translate to hypocalcemia not working bipolar which is true one more thing what madam has said is very true there has to be a period change surgery here huh? when you send a pth intraoperative Please pth value so when we are operating for a P uh, parathyroid adenoma we usually send a preoperative pth then after surgery probably 5 to 10 minutes after that we again send a pth value and we also send it for frozen section. Sometimes the frozen section comes earlier than the PTH. So both of them are correlating. So they are able to tell us that it is an adenoma on the frozen section. Let's post of PTH because the half life is very low, falls down. That way that is how we are monitoring. We have they take it in ice and we have in in-house PTH system. Ours is regularly an EDTS sample, IML of and it is uh, at induction, yeah, first uh, cannula when you put on the table is the pre sample. Post sample is uh, 15 minutes. Usually they say around 11 minutes is ah. the half life. So 15th minute we usually by clock we take it uh, 15 minutes. Hmm. Second sure. sample I usually tend to take through the IJ on the table itself. So I hand over the oh, sample to the sample? anesthetist when hmm. I do it. So that is so easier plan. way of uh, doing things. And gold chain, as Madam mentioned, specifically ABG box, you put it in that, you send immediately and ensure that it happens fast. What is your practice for uh, parathyroid adenomas? Is it a focused incision if there is a preoperative? Uh, if it's a well delineated radiologically and sometimes it is mm -hmm. clinically palpable, then it is a focused incision. Okay. Otherwise, the initial incision? Otherwise, the usual incision. Sorry. Basically, when you reach the symmetry, it reaches usually. When you reach the symmetry for the incision, it usually is a bigger incision because most of the time when you do a focus, it is a very small one-sided incision. Unless it is an elderly lady where you are not looking for cosmosis, it is fine. Sometimes what happens is uh, there is just about a 2.5 centimeter the left lower pole, right lower pole, what just happens? to make Fast a small incision along the anterior pole Give me a deeper one. Pluck it out. Uh, good. Are uncommon. Uh, no, like there are few in which you have a palpable parathyroid trier itself, where you have a normal gland which is not palpable. The thyroid is not palpable, not but you have a good uh, palpable parathyroid. Say two and a half, two, two and a half, three centimeters. No, Those are very easy to do, down, provided yeah. you have a box. just like a different biopsy. Usually, it is in Usually, what we have come across, it's not very palpable. Most of these, most of them, they're non palpable. Okay, because here, so most of the patients who present to pancreatitis, renal calliculi, they're not, it is not palpable. Most of them, they are very small. But sometimes you have uh, these big nodules which mistaken for a lymph node, and when they got evaluated, they turned out to be. Parathyroid adenomas. Correct. Uh, sir, any experience with three right. and a half gland? And... Ah. The hyperplasia is very uncommon in our country, fortunately for the surgeons, because it is a really surgical challenge. One or two cases where we have done men's with hypercalcemia. Then there are patients who had a hyperplasia with the head to three and up. And one, one in fact, uh, ended up in hypercalcemia lifelong. That is a disastrous complication to have, very difficult to manage. But that's the potential problem with the three and up glands, uh, hyperparathyroidectomy. Parathyroidectomy, sorry. Till now, I have had only system maybe picked up two glands, they're opposite sides. But uh, on uh, doing actually, with the one gland out, I was you able to get 50% uh, out. So I did not attempt for the next Pectum, gland, uh. that was the culprit. Uh, system maybe can sometimes be very misleading because it has got a lot to do with the time duration, the way it is uh, interpreted. Only on a delayed time, more than 90 minutes if you are able to pick up the are good sometimes 60 minutes one will show you two glands which is very false so you should be very careful how the things show are me what you're saying change your business no sir i'm done with the right side yeah so we can see clearly i hope 
<laughs> I think uh, the, uh, yeah. he has to focus. In yeah, the he has to yeah. focus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think this is coming in the way. Yeah. No, we can see the recurrent laryngeal now there. Yeah, but can you see the... Yeah, I can see the now. Again, your visualist thing is coming in the way. Ah. Yeah, okay. Entering so into we the can see, inlet there. Yeah, you can see the superior laryngeal here. Yeah. You can see you, that. You can see the inferior parathyroid here. But that's not being that's visible. Uh, not visible. It's not because clearly seen. I think uh, he has to retract it strongly downwards. And this is the RLM. Yeah, now it's much better. Can you retract the trachea medially and cranially? Yeah. 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 That's better. Yeah. This is the RLM. The inferior parathyroid. Again, my thing is coming in the way. Maybe yeah. you can use a hand retractor just for yeah. this part. This yeah, part. Then that would be better. Yeah, I think it's... Because the angulation of the retractor is... Yeah, it's off. not good. Come, get me retractor, regular retractor. Yeah. It's much better now. Again. This is the parathyroid. Yeah. Come here now, a little bit. You have to show from my side. Yeah. So he has to focus it. Focus, focus. Yeah, yeah. that is the inferior okay. parathyroid. Yeah. This is the RLM going up to the cricothyroid and this is the superior laryngeal. Okay, you have completed, this is the trachea. It's a beautifully demonstrated right side uh, dissection, uh, Sridhar. Thank you, sir. Absolutely bloodless, side. absolutely bloodless, crystal clear. I think shall we invite the invited up. lecture? I think we can go for uh, the nuclear medicine lecture, sir. Yeah. 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 Right side up, left side up. I'd like to invite Dr. Vishnu uh, for a lecture on nuclear medicine aspects of parathyroid adenomas. Keep a glass, please. So good afternoon. So, we are going into the nuclear medicine evaluation for locating the parathyroid adenomas, both utopic as well as ectopic adenomas. So, uh, primary hyperparathyroidism because of increased synthesis and release of PTH, decreased calcium and low phosphorus levels. So, mostly it is because of uh, single hyperfunctioning adenoma, 10% because of multi-gland hyperplasia and double adenomas and only 1-3% to because of carcinomas. So, in general, in nuclear medicine, it's uh, larger than 500 mg, adenomas can be detected skintigraphically, or mostly th more than 300 to 500 mg can be detected. And hyperplastic glands uh, can be detected but with less sensitivity than adenomas. And what is the need or requirement for localization? So with the advent of minimally invasive surgery, it can reduce the morbidity and mortality, it can guide surgical management and it can reduce recurrence or re-exploration rate. And mostly in ectopic parathyroid, we need to locate the uh, uh, parathyroid adenomas before surgery. One percentage of superior glands and 40 percentage of inferior glands can be ectopic. And the adenoma versus hyperplasia differentiation is very important as adenoma, if it is single, you can treat it uh, surgically with focused parathyroidectomy. So what are the imaging options? The initial modality will be ultrasound and then the system may be with SPECT CT, then 4D CT or 4D MRI and fluorocholine PET CT. So the USG will be the initial modality when we uh, get come across a uh, patient and morphological characteristics best seen on USG with uh, homogeneously hypoechoic lesion with increased vascularity but the problem is with uh, ectopic adenomas having a poor detection rate and with limited sensitivity of 29 to 55 percentage. So what are the nuclear medicine imaging options for localization of parathyroid adenomas? So both gamma camera based radio pharmaceuticals and uh, PET uh, radio pharmaceuticals are there. In gamma camera base, it starts with a thallium 201 technician pertechnate in the olden days with dual trace subtraction technique. Then comes the technician pertechnate, which will go only to thyroid and systemic will go to thyroid and parathyroid so that we can subtract and we can able to differentiate the uh, adenomas. And now the system will be dual phase technique, means the early phase uh, image at 20 minutes and delayed phase at uh, 2 hours, which uh, co combined with the early spec CT. And the pet radio pharmaceuticals, the fluorocholine the C11 choline and C11 methionine. As C11 is not used now because C11 half-life is very less, so uh, in, in hospital cyclotron is needed for that uh, radio pharmaceuticals. So what is the mechanism of localization of these tracers? Uh, system maybe is a lipophilic cation. 
So it will go inside the oxyphilic rich, mitochondrial rich oxyphilic cells in the adenomas and it will retain there. But the normal parathyroid glands which have appropriate, with appropriately high serum calcium will become dormant whereas the adenomas will take up because of the more amount of ATP which is produced. And the sensitivity and diagnostic accuracy in each is USG is 88.1% uh, 86.6% diagnostic accuracy. When you come to the planar maybe it is only have a 63% and 65 to 97% diagnostic accuracy. And when you combine with the spec CT the sensitivity is going to 91.5% and 90% diagnostic accuracy. And when you combine both USG findings as well as this technician maybe and with spec CT it is 98.3% sensitivity and 96.6% .6 of diagnostic accuracy. So these are the ectopic and utopic locations of parathyroid adenoma. So we used, we used to scan from the including the parotid glands uh, angle of mandible till the base of the heart. So you can see the ectopic parathyroid glands in the carotid sheath, in the submandible location, in the retropharyngeal location, within the thyroid gland, in the thyrothymic tract, in the mediastinum, anterior mediastinum, superior mediastinum, in the retroesophageal location, paraesophageal location. So uh, you have to uh, scan from the angle of mandible till the base of the heart. And the protocol which is following is we used to inject 20 to 30 millicurie intravenously and used to take anterior planar images of the neck to visualize the parotid glands uh, cranially and extending to the neck and chest and covering till the base of the heart approximately 15 minutes after injection and repeated approximately 120 minutes later for the delayed retention. And spec CT will perform early after the planar imaging is finished. So there's a normal biodistribution of maybe you can see the parotid glands, submandibular glands and uh, you can see the uh, normal thyroid, ha heart uptake and liver uptake and the injected tracer uh, through the vein. So these are the locations of the normal uh, utopic parathyroid glands. The red dots mark the superior parathyroid uh, glands which is located posterior to the superior and middle third of the thyroid gland and the blue dot showing the inferior parathyroid glands which is posterior lateral or anterior to the inferior third of the thyroid gland. This is the locations of ectopic starting with the carotid sheet, submandible location, within the thyroid gland, in the thyrothermic tract, in the mediastinum. So how will you interpret a uh, uh, scan? So the abnormal parathyroid tissue on the initial scan will have a focal uptake in relation to the thyroid gland and it becomes more prominent on the delayed images because of the slower washout of the adenoma uh, than from the thyroid. So, but uh, 10 to 15 percentage of adenomas will show rapid washout. So, you will not see on the delayed scan. So, there comes the spec CT on the early imaging. So, if you do a spec CT at 20 minutes, you can able to still visualize the adenomas which having a rapid washout. And many hyperplastic glands show such rapid washout. So, the spec CT is very important apart from the planar imaging. Then, and also the false positive and false negative findings on a parathyroid skin tigraphy. The basic false negative is small size. If it is less than 300 mg, if it, the parathyroid hyperplasia is there, if there is multi gland disease, and also the P glycoprotein, which causes the efflux of tracer from the um, uh, gland sooner, which causes rapid washout. And also, few adenomas have few oxyphil cells, so the mitochondria will be less, so that the uptake also will be less. And also sometimes ectopic adenomas which is very small in size can be missed on a scintigraphy. And false positive causes can be uh, multinodular goiters, thyroid nodules, thyroid carcinomas, sometimes a lymph node which is metabolically active, sometimes lymphomas, sometimes granulomatous process, brown tumors, these can be falsely positive on a scintigraphy. So this is on the planar image, you can see on the right side inferiorly there is a focal tracer uptake on the initial image at 20 minute and on the 2 hour image also that tracer uptake is still retaining and all other uh, left side it is uh, washing out. So there is a right inferior parathyroid adenoma which is located uh, for, uh, well localized on a spec CT. This is another case which is showing on the initial image there is a mild incongruence on the right lower pole region on 20 minute and on the one hour image it's well localized it's uh, retaining that tracer on the delayed images and spec CT is well localized on the right paratracheal location inferior to the uh, lower pole of the th uh, thyroid gland so this is the right superior parathyroid adenoma again localizing sometimes this uh, case comes up like initial planar image there is not much localization and the delayed images it is washing out but on the spec CT, on the initial image, you can uh, localize there is a left sided small sized around less than 1 centimeter adenoma which is uh, well picked up on the spec CT. But the planar images was negative. 
So this is an ectopic mediastinal adenoma which was found on the planar image itself which was, which was found and delayed image also which was retaining that tracer and on the spec CT is localized on the anterior mediastinum. This is another uh, ectopic anterior mediastinal adenoma in the suprastodal notch region. So the another problem is the operated neck and the small size and multi-gland disease where the system may be with or without spec CT will be less sensitive especially in less than 300 mg or with persistent or recurrent hyperparathyroidism cases. So if clinical suspicion is high or a previously operated neck with high suspicion of recurrence the 4D CT or fluorocholine PET CT will be highly beneficial in management. So a typical adenoma on a 4D CT in a non-contrast CT compared to the normal enhancement in the thyroid parenchyma, we can able to appreciate the uh, adenoma which will be hypodense and on the RTL phase there will be intense RTL enhancement on the venous phase there will be washout and also the f choline PET CT also can pick up uh, highly sensitive of 95% sensitivity in picking up the disease even in an operated neck. So these are the uh, 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 recent articles comparing the fluorocholine PET and multiphase CT integration. So, uh, in this uh, study, it was showing that if, even if you combine the fluorocholine PET CT and 4D CT and fluorocholine PET alone, they are both having sensitivity of equal chance and uh, it further investigations involving larger group of uh, people should be needed for a one-stop modality of fluorocholine PET and 4D CT combining to have in, in certain situations if you miss the adenomas on early maybe scans. And fluorocholine PET and 4D CT for primary hyperparathyroidism, uh, the challenge of reoperative patients. So here also the on a per lesion analysis, sensitivity, specificity, positive PPV and NPV were 96%, 13%, 77%, and 50% in fluorocholine PET CT, and sensitivity was 85% for fluorocholine PET CT and 63% for 4D CT. So these results has, uh, made it possible to successfully remove abnormal gland 21 patients, including 12 with negative or discordant ultrasound or maybe integrity result with a global cure rate of 73%. So thus the fluorocholine PET is a promising tool in challenging per population with re in especially in reoperative patients with primary hyperparathyroidism and parathyroid 4D CT appears as a confirmatory imaging modality. So in summary maybe scans have 80 to 90% sensitivity. It can be lesser in multi-gland disease, hyperplasia, smaller size, persistent hyperparathyroidism or recurrent hyperparathyroidism. In such cases, fluorocholine PET CT scans have sensitivity of 95%, better in above limitations of MIBI scans, and 4D CT is almost as good as fluorocholine PET CT. An integrated 4D CT, fluorocholine PET CT will be upcoming modality, and it can be a one stop shop modality, uh, and especially in case of reoperated neck uh, cases. Thank you. Talk. Very challenging area. Is the 4D CT is available here? 4D CT with the integrated with the PET CT available? Uh, not here, no. Anywhere in the, in the country? Uh, 4D CT is available. 4D, 4D CT is available. Integrated 4D CT with the uh, in uh, scan. Uh, not sure, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Vishnu. Uh, so, uh, what we'll do now is, uh, it's already lunch time, so probably let the opposite uh, surgery for the opposite gland, be, it will be streamed, all of us can go and have lunch, by then uh, the next case will be taken, which will be done by Dr. Arvind, that is going to be a lateral approach to thyroid, uh, however, uh, Dr. Raju will be leaving a little early, so I would want to present him with a memento, and uh, then he can have lunch with us. Dr. Raju has been like a guru for a lot of surgical oncologists, though I did not have the opportunity to directly work with him, I have heard a lot about him. Uh, he is one man to lo actually look up to, at least in the surgical oncology community. Thank you so much, sir. So I think already some delegates are already having their lunch, so rest of us also will join them. So meanwhile, uh, the surgery will anyway be streamed. Okay, so whoever is interested can have a quick lunch and come back.
సరే నేను Am I audible? But my mic is not on. One second. Dr. Sridhar, this is Varun. Yeah, Varun, I can hear you. Tell me. Nothing. So, you can continue with the surgery. Yeah. So, all the delegates are having lunch. They will come back. Okay. By then, we will get the other OT also ready. Sure. Sure. I am almost okay. done. Okay. Not a problem. Thank you. 
Dr. Violist Productions.
इतना पकड़ पकड़ कर इसे
So we'll start the next uh, thyroidectomy in probably 15 minutes. The patient is getting induced and being positioned. So this uh, will be through a lateral approach. Uh, it is not the conventional approach used by most surgeons, but usually oncosurgeons are used to this because uh, we operate on recurrent cases or cases where already the planes have been violated. So Dr. Arvind will be coming with me along to the OT. Okay. So if you have any doubts, even regarding mornings uh, cases, operative wise or how we work up thyroid nodules, you can just feel free. There are mics in the center. Just feel free to ask. We'll answer this. Thank you.
हमें और रोटी यस यू आर वेरी मच आर यू गेज रेडी गोर कैन यू स्टॉप स्ट्रीमिंग no we wanted to show the positioning and the draping also for the patient which is yeah. about to happen uh, yeah. we'll stream that as well and we'll just put a hair patch over the eyes and then you can do it i think that should be better I think you can start explaining, uh, Varun. Yeah, this is Dr. Ajay Varun. So this patient is a 34-year-old female who complained of a swelling in front of the neck. On examination, there was a three into four centimeter palpable lump in the left side of the thyroid lobe, which was moving with deglutition. So on further investigations on ultrasound, it was a thyroid spy lesion. and then we did an fnac and that has come as bethesda 2 so if you have followed the discussion in the morning this is one of those cases where there is a discordance between the tyrat scoring and the fnac also the patient was very keen in undergoing a surgery for cosmetic reasons she also had a strong family history of ca stomach and we had done an endoscopy in her and that came out to be normal so as you see this patient is already positioned so here you can see the sandbag that is placed beneath the shoulder blades and both the arms are tucked in so and then stretched so that gives a good stretch on the neck above if you see there is a head ring that is placed and the neck is completely extended so here you can see that there is a good amount of extension that we have given by placing the sandbag and the head ring now we are going to uh, paint this patient can you continue we have our scrub nurse uh, gokarna brother doing the scrubbing and then we we'll paint the patient and then we'll drape we'll show you the draping as well so uh, there is some confusion sometimes uh, uh for thyroid malignancies uh, people say that you should not use uh, <coughs> iodinated uh, cleaning material like levo's iodine in the then that it might somehow interfere with the post operative radio iodine uh, uptake but uh, actually it's not any true facts you can very much use uh, Lugol iodine. I mean, not Lugol iodine. Just generally, propylene iodine for painting and draping uh, of any thyroid cancer, thyroid lump, or even uh, when it's thyroid malignancy as well. The second thing is uh, the use of infiltration. Infiltration is uh, is useful in the sense that the small blood vessels of the subcutaneous tissue they may undergo vasoconstriction, uh, and it allows you to go up to the level of the platysma. Uh, with a single uh, incision itself and um, creates a relatively uh, bloodless feel but again this is a personal choice some uh, some people do use it other people uh, tend to avoid it <coughs> now there is a trend towards scarless thyroidectomies as uh, we were just discussing so this is uh, basically minimally invasive thyroidectomy is done through a robotic approach uh, they are called different nomenclatures used uh, one is known as uh, Second is known as RABAT. So that is a robotic assisted bilateral axillary or trans axillary thyroidectomy, and there are special type of retractors which are used. These are called as BABA retractors. So uh, this is something which is taking up in a big way. Um, there is also trans oral approach, wherein which you enter into the pre uh, 
pre laryngeal as well as the pre uh, uh, space which is uh, deep to the uh, sublingual salivary glands by giving a perifrenular incision that is through the floor of the mouth and then you enter into the <coughs> space deep to the uh, strap muscles and do a thyroidectomy from the cranial approach so this is also been done uh, by a lot of people uh, especially in american oncology and some centers like apollo but yeah but essentially that is converting a clean case into an extremely contaminated case uh, because the oral cavity as you know contains more number of organisms per ml of saliva than is present actually in the rectum and the anal canal as well so but yes definitely the trans axillary approach may be something which uh, can be tried especially for people who are absolutely keen on not having any scar uh, in the neck <coughs> So, Varun, um, Dr. Arvind is available right now? Yeah, Dr. Arvind is just scrubbed up. Okay. So, I think there are some questions uh, during uh, the uh, afternoon session regarding uh, the use of um, uh, what is the time duration at which, uh, what is the timing at which you are supposed to check for uh, PTH and also whether we give a routine calcium, especially when we do a total hydrectomy. So, in this particular patient, we are actually seeing uh, almost two parathyroids definitely that is the right inferior parathyroid and then the right and the left superior parathyroid. So, more than two parathyroids, if you are seeing, then actually we do not even go for any um, calcium estimation. But yes, generally the half life of the calcium will be about 12 to 14 hours, which is bound to the albumin level, and therefore, uh, there is no point giving or checking for calcium on day one. It is always better to do it on day two. And regarding whether we do a PTH estimation or not, so the PTH estimation initially, at least post surgery, can be elevated or can be decreased surreptitiously because you might have mobilized the parathyroid. And any mobilization of the parathyroid can sometimes lead to spuriously high levels of PTH levels. So generally, I think about you know, about at least two weeks should elapse, or three to seven days should elapse before one should actually go for a PTH estimation, at least to check for uh, temporary hypoparathyroidism. Permanent hypoparathyroidism uh, will be actually made out only after six months. That is the definition. So, if you have a parathyroid level less than the lower limit of normal, somewhere between 15 picogram per ml at the end of 6 months, even on calcium supplementation, then it would mean that this patient is most likely, most likely going to land up with permanent hypoparathyroidism and permanent hypocalcemia and would require lifelong supplementation. <laughs> So, this is the, the approach which they are going to show the, for this particular case. I think it has been extensively uh, described by our faculty members, uh, which is known as the lateral approach. In fact, uh, this is an approach which is very good because uh, the most of the uh, symptomatic complaint that the patient says after the surgery, that is difficulty in swallowing, a sense of dragging, sense of heaviness deep to the scar line can be avoided because we do not cut the strap muscles. So, previously the teaching was that the strap muscles have to be cut at the cranial end because the innervation that is from the cervicalis comes uh, from the cranial end itself and therefore if you divide it, it has to be divided at the upper end, not at the lower end. But I think right now the current literature states that these are about segmental innervation and therefore you can cut the strap muscles at any level and it is not going to directly impact the speech and swallowing for the patient. Yes, sir, have you had any? Yeah. Sir, I want to know and clarify students also, after total thyroidectomy, when we should start giving, supplementing thyroid hormone? Exactly after 24 hours or there is a time? So, this is a very good question and uh, it is a two-part answer. So, the first part is whether you are dealing with the malignancy or not. So, if you are having any suspicion that you are going to land up with giving radioiodine in the post-operative period, then it is better not to start uh, any form of 
thyroid hormone supplementation even post total thyroidectomy as long as the patient was not hypothyroid prior to the surgery so the, the half life of the t4 hormone is about 14 days actually so till about 14 days the patient is not going to land up with severe life threatening hypothyroidism or its features but yes the patient will develop some symptoms like um, difficulty in, in speech some amount of uh, facial edema facial puffiness sleep disturbances menstrual disturbances they will be there but this is to be done especially when you are thinking that there is a chance for malignancy if you are sure that there is no malignancy you can start off from day one there is no issue sir. after multinodular goiter yeah. total thyroidectomy as we have done today's case yeah. so in that case it should be started the next day and when we should go for repeat thyroid profile sir so actually you don't need to as i said madam if the patient is even for a, a youth thyroid patient as you say you had a multinodular goiter the actual uh, substitutive or the substitutive dose of thyroxin is about 1.6 microgram per kg of body weight so in general for a 60 kg woman it would be somewhere close to about 85 to 90 so say you can say naltrexin 100 so thyroid am 100 mg but what we actually see is that as long as a patient is not going to have any further strenuous events like pregnancy or lactation you can actually wait for 6 weeks also to get a thyroid profile and see the T3 and T4 and TSH. If the TSH is elevated to more than 6 uh, micro-intentional units, then you can start for some form of uh, thyroid. We actually, even for a total thyroidectomy, we actually don't uh, regularly give thyroid supplementation at the time of discharge. We ask them to come back after 6 weeks, get a thyroid profile, see the T3, T3, T4 as well as a TSH. If they are normal, we just send them back. This, they tend to do well, madam. Even after thyroidectomy? Yes, total thyroidectomy also. Is there a they will have normal thyroid profile? Yes, it is, it is most of the time you will have normal thyroid profile. Most of the time it happens. <laughs> Because as the textbook says, from the next yeah. day you can start thyroxine. You can start, madam, no issues. But we have seen that lots of times that it you actually, they, do, they can be avoided, uh, you can avoid thyroid supplementation But at of all. Of course, in HEMI it could be avoided and we should wait for the thyroid profile yeah. after six weeks. Yes. Hello, do you know? Yes, Arvind, sir, I am... Uh, you are audible? Yeah, you are very much audible, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Right. You see, she has uh, two prominent crease. One is at the lower border, one is at the higher, uh, upper border. I mean, go for the upper border one. Yes, sir, it's, I think the lower border crease is also good. Yeah, over uh, lower border is good. good. I think you can use that also, sir. Yeah, you can use this also, not an yeah. issue. You yeah. can use this one also. Now. But the most common, I think there are two or three upper yeah. Yes, three. One, I think, one, three. Yeah, the third one also can be used. Yeah, you can even utilize this, not yeah. an issue. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Ah, this is Dr. Arvin. Uh, I am a, consul uh, a consultant from uh, Ramya Medical College. And uh, one of the panelists in the morning. Uh, good afternoon everyone, after your uh, afternoon lunch I am trying to do something interesting, hope I will keep you engaged for the afternoon. I think I will go for the lower crease, not an issue. Huh? No, you are comfortable sir, I yeah. think uh, it is a small uh, hemi only. Yeah, both, think, are uh, both, both, are both are fine, yeah. we are able to see here also and here also, this one will be slightly cosmetic if we take the upper one. Yes. What trip is first? Which are your comfortable? No issues. So what is the settings? Uh, settings, uh, you put on uh, spray for me. Yeah, spray. Uh, spray 30, uh, pure, uh, pure 35. Uh, 35. And uh, bipolar 20. Standard. Okay. Ah. Yeah. 
for this. Uh, you are able to visualize the crease here, well? Yes, sir. The audience is able to appreciate it very well. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I am using uh, pure cut for uh, 35. Uh, uh, Coagulation 30 and my bipolar at uh, 20 standard. Okay. Uh, I don't use uh, knife usually. I tend to do with the cartridge itself. So you are using a pure mode or a blend mode, sir, for this uh, initial pure, pure, pure. Okay, and you regularly use it, sir? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, for a long time now, I have uh, given up knife for almost, uh, uh, say, for seven, eight years. Okay, excellent, excellent. So, does not, you don't feel as any... No, I don't feel, but yeah. uh, definitely sometimes you have a little bit of uh, uh, DAP at the edge of the crease the post uh, surgery, but by Three weeks, everything is same. There is not much of a difference. Okay, I think this this uh, reduces the bleeding areas a lot from the uh, dermal uh? I think it reduces the bleeding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And I'm using spray card remover. Yeah, I'm using spray. I'm using, uh, spray. I'm okay. using uh, uh, this. Uh, give me all uh, uh, dry mops, I don't use wet. Huh? So, yeah, that is my platysma. You are able to see the platysma? Yes, sir. Very nicely, we are able to see the subcutaneous tissue. The platysma. I am just cutting the platysma. It is line, there is a deficiency of platysma. What about the stomach mastoid? There is a deficiency of platysma. That is the message that should go. Where you go deep and where you go superficial, it's very important when you do any neck, neck surgery, not only thyroid surgery actually. Small vein. Skin. What's it? This is the way I was telling you. They tend to usually be there. You just have to look for them. One more hook, please. See, this is what I meant you just push with your uh, unactivated cutry, the uh, vein tends to do what this huh? that makes you bolder enough to take it more higher. Okay. Already we are very 
So that you are stopping with the there's a more chance that you land up with uh, zero mass post operatively. Yeah, just to ease myself, I have actually included the plants under the hook so that I put it below. So Sir, you are coming, uh, you are coming, I think the camera has to reorient. Okay. Yeah, this is a better thing. So, yeah. Actually, I have put the plants under the hook. Sir, focus issue, uh, can you just uh, tell them to bit of uh, haziness is there? Action from this. Yeah. I think the camera should come from a higher angle, I guess. Then it will be good. Yeah, focusing is good now. Very good. Yes. You can raise the flap lower also. I think during the lower flap raise, we cannot see. <laughs> the, the cameraman gets blinded, I guess. Mm -hmm. Retractor. You'll have to put this down. Now I'm trying to search for the lateral border. Yes, yeah, so uh, yeah. For since we are going for the lateral approach, so the first landmark they are not actually checking the strap muscles. The first landmark would be checking the medial border of the sternum asteroid and the lateral border of the strap muscles. In that plane, which is generally what we use for doing a neck dissection, yeah. that's the plane and that we have to enter. Yeah. yeah. So I think the Counter traction is being given uh, over the strap muscles, and we have to delineate the medial border of the sternum asteroid. You have tip cleaners. This is the sternum asteroid border. Can I have a suture, please? Oh. Any drain suture would do. So, uh, yeah. while you're doing so, we, I want to give it uh, yeah. a thank you, sincere thanks, and goodbye to Dr. Uh, Karthik, uh, who is uh, due for leaving uh, to my side right now. So, I think a warm round of applause for our eminent uh, panel members. And uh, please accept a moment of uh, uh, our side. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Karthik. And uh, see you for the next conference. Thank you.
other issues. <clears throat> we are not very clear about uh, length of incisions. You can definitely increase. Definitely increase. I will make it uh, symmetrical. Exactly. Yeah. So the important thing is uh, sometimes when people do heavy paradectomies, they tend to do a start only one side of the midline, hoping that yeah. you know a small incision is better. Mm. But especially when you do the skin crease, yeah. the pull of the scar is going to cause a lot of asymmetry, yeah. especially over the neck crease, and that actually is very bad. So it's better to position as long as that it's bilaterally symmetrical across the midline. Yeah. No suture. Eh? Cutting silk, anything bigger one. Cut cutting one you have. No cutting. No, no, no. Here only. Two for such piece. This is too small. I think it should have a thicker suture. This won't stay usually. This is what I mentioned in the morning. By chance you don't have a jewels or a this. I usually tend to put this. Yeah, some sutures to the latissima uh, yeah. and putting artery forceps will go a long way in uh, improving the exposure. Yeah. Ah, right, fine, it's okay. Huh. So the trick is you have to, a lot of people put the incision. Suture? No. Uh, put one, uh, one something. Especially the upper, upper flap. People uh, tend to put a suture through yeah. to the chin actually, the chin skin. I think that uh, causes, uh, tends to cause a, a stitch no, granuloma no, uh, mm. post-operatively. So that has to be avoided. As far as possible, you take a suture through the platysma, there is no what issue. What do you use for a drain usually? But then it's, it should be huh? fixed ah, to the drain rather than That's giving a, uh, you know, unsightly stack at the level of the chin. Don't uh, put the ratchet completely, just uh, hold it. Cut, 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 cut. Mm. Don't hold it. This way. I think people may be getting a bit this one uh, because you're doing the third side or side. Anyway, I have a couple of trivia questions to any of the mm. postgraduates in the crowd. This is uh, uh, thyroid storm. Does anybody know? What is thyroid storm? Anybody can come onto the mic and just give an answer. What is thyroid storm? Anybody any of the any postgraduates? Any surgery postgraduates are here? Telling a lot about thyroid storm. Where is thyroid storm exactly? Which condition is it seen in? No takers. <laughs> Encouraging you people, you must answer. Maybe a wrong thing. What is there? He is not going to give you any marks. Somebody yeah, yeah. Somebody <laughs> should come out and speak. <laughs> to he will tell you. Most of the time, I ask questions because I don't know the answer. <laughs> I try to elicit answers which for questions I don't know. Yeah. yeah, so thyroid storm is something when you know the patient is hyperthyroid That's and uh, they do not undergo preoperative preparation, reducing the vascularity of the thyroid, then it results in a, a syndrome called as thyroid storm, where in which the thyroid hormones are released into the blood circulation and leads to fluctuations in blood pressure as well as a uh, lot of uh, cardiovascular issues. Uh, instead of going on the midline, yes, here I am trying to go on the anterior border of the sternum as right. Yeah. You are able to see. Yeah. So the straps are near your left hand and the middle border of the sternum as right is seen inferiorly. Okay. And you are opening the okay. carotid sheet almost. Okay. This yeah. is the IJB that you are able to see here. Yeah. The use of a spray mode is very good actually. It is reducing a large amount of the small blades. Uh, but uh, uh, but actually, uh, 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 yeah, small yeah. amount of caution. But yeah, yeah. You don't take it close to the. Yeah. Uh, you have to be experienced to use it. Yeah. You have to be experienced to use it. 
loosen this. The straps overlying the lateral aspect of the gland actually right now. The good part of this is you do not need too much traction for the superior pole, you just have to separate them, you will be able to see the gland. You have a vascular, yeah, be back. Thank you. That's it. Again, another question which I hope will be answered. <laughs> what is thyroid paradox? Anybody knows what is thyroid paradox? This is a question which is asked in the exams also. Paradoxical. What is a thyroid paradox? Anybody else? I am hearing some answers. People who have enjoyed the lunch. <laughs> so, the thyroid paradox is a condition where in which a benign thyroid highly cystic in age because of the presence of the intercystic pressure becomes extremely tense. So, these kind of tense thyroid nodules they mimic a malignancy. Sometimes you may have benign thyroid nodules which are filled with colloid, filled with cystic fluid, tense cystic fluid and when you palpate them you are extremely hard to palpate. So this is a paradoxical situation. I actually think you are dealing with a malignancy but it is actually a benign condition. So the way to differentiate it is again ultrasound. So the ultrasound will help in differentiating between a solid and cystic tumor. If it is hard and it is solid, it is most likely malignant. Most of the time it is malignant unless there is some secondary component of Thyroiditis, long standing thyroiditis. So, yeah. So, yes, sir, you are telling something. Shridhar, yes, sir. You can see this is the omohyoid here. Yes, yeah, sir. The inferior below the omohyoid. Yes. Okay. The other two are the uh, medial straps. Yes, sir. And still, see, this is the omohyoid. Just yes, extending it slightly so that I can have a better vision. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So, this is the omohyoid here. Yes, sir. You can either decide to divide it or you can decide to uh, uh, lateralize it. I will try to lateralize it as fast as possible. Yes. So, basically, you put the omohyoid, you send the omohyoid inferiorly, yeah. not superiorly, right? Yeah. Sir, yeah. So because your plane of dissection is cranial to the omohyoid. I will try to actually to reach to the upper pole now. Yeah. So, you try to uh, retract the omohyoid inferiorly yeah. so that the structure which is super in this case, which is going to be the thyroid comes into play. Yeah. The reverse is done when you are doing, say, for example, uh, in for CA esophagus, where again you are doing a neck neck, neck mobilization yeah. of the yeah. esophagus. Yeah. That again in the same yeah. area you will yeah. find the inferior belly of the omohyoid. In that particular case, you will try to flip the inferior belly cranially because your area of interest is actually inferior to the omohyoid, that is the esophagus. Okay. Here you can see sir is gently retracting the inferior belly caudally to the lower pole. So there will be always some amount of fascia, facial coverings around each and every structure in the neck. So the aim is to somehow through a combination of sharp and blunt dissection enter the correct places, correct, enter the correct planes and then try to do everything in a avascular fashion as you are you know, beautifully being demonstrated here. Yeah, so we can see the inferior belly of omohyoid now, yes, some small bleed has been tackled. You are right on the gland now, sir? Yeah, almost uh, near the gland. You are on the gland. Still there are few straps on it. I am still trying to put the strap. There is another uh, group of strap muscle close by to it.
that is the gland actually So you are separating the IJV from the glands, sir? Yeah, yeah. So this is the thing actually, the internal jella vein will be the one which will come into play mm -hmm. when you are doing a lateral approach. So because that is going to be right in the field, normally when you do a regular paradectomy, because we are going medial to the strap muscles and we are going medial to the carotids actually, the uh, internal jugular vein automatically which is lateral to the carotid gets pushed away. But when you're doing a lateral approach, the V actually start laterally, see the carotid uh, and the IJV actually overlaps the carotid. Hmm? So now you are able to see the carotid here? Yeah, I think yes sir. Yes. Yeah, this is the carotid here? Yeah. Okay. Yes sir. This is your upper pole here? Yeah. Right? Mm, yes sir. Huh? The visibility of upper pole is far superior when you do it from the lateral aspect actually. One more fake layer here. So a lot of loose area tissue which has to be gently swept away and that improves the mobility of the gland actually. Especially long standing goiters, they tend to have conversations of this loose area tissue which you know sometimes in the initial stages every time Every thick fiber you think is a, is a RLN actually. So, initially we will be hesitant to cut anything which is going transversely, anything or, or, or anything which is going along the line of the thyroid gland, we think it is the RLN because uh, we are anatomically poor. So, once as you, still, as you do more and more number of cases and uh, you get you know, a feel of what is tissue and what is now, it is only then that you can actually Confident in your thyroidectomy. So, the last one more trivial question. So, what is uh, phantom thyroidectomy? Does anybody know what is phantom thyroidectomy? Bipolar. So, this is a condition where uh, patients who have got hyperthyroidism and uh, they are not getting properly controlled with uh, your Lugol sardine and your pre medication. So, what they should do in the olden days is that they should take the patient Sorry. continuously every day to the OT. So, today is Monday, today is Sunday, you will take the patient to the OT. So, once the patient goes to on the way to the OT, then the flight and flight response get activated, patient gets tachycardic, gets scared, and there is a big jump and spike in the blood pressure. They take the patient to the operation theater, they do not do anything come out. The same thing is repeated again on Tuesday, the same technique is repeated on Monday, Thursday, Thursday. So finally, it is like calling wolf. So finally, the patient believes that this is taking away, they are not going to do the surgery. And the time when the blood pressure and the heart rate are normal, that is when they do the thyroidectomy. So essentially, this is a stealing, stealing the thyroid by confusing the patient. This is known as phantom thyroidectomy. You see that we have to retract the strap muscles without dividing the strap muscles. So, a few points about this particular patient. So, she is a uh, 34 year old lady who has got an extremely uh, significant family history of cancer. Actually, she had undergone uh, formal genetic assessment and a pedigree charting, and they found that three successive generations along her uh, mother's as well as um, father's side have, were suffering from uh, stomach cancer. So, in fact, her mother died of stomach cancer below the age of 45 years. Her mother's sister died from stomach cancer at the age of 40 years. Right. And the mother's brother is a 
or uncle also succumb to some cancer all of them below the age of 40 years so, so there are certain cancers which run in families they may not always have a genetic component especially if it is seen beyond the age of 60 to 70 years which fits with the general timeline for sporadic cancers but when you see multiple generations having cancers below the age of the expected normal age like for example 40 years 45 years then it should always be we should always that it may be dealing with some genetic mutation so she underwent a what is known as germline testing and nowadays we have multiple panel known as mgs next generation sequencing patient's blood is taken sent to a lab the lab runs multiple uh, tests on the nucleated cells in the blood that is a wbc and they send it to they put it on a panel where in which multiple genes are there and whichever gene shows a mutation it is like it is shown in the computer software so this particular lady had a, a mutation in the, what is known as the msh2 gene so this may be too much for you but Change. basically what the msh2 gene is it is, it is uh, a particular syndrome called as lynch syndrome where in which patients have a few set of cancers which they are highly predisposed to one of them is gastric cancer, second is pancreatic cancer, third is endometrial cancer, fourth is breast cancer, but not thyroid cancer. So actually before this surgery was taken up, the patient was screened by an upper G endoscopy, the upper G endoscopy was normal, her ultrasound abdomen was done, her ultrasound abdomen also was normal. And uh, then we did a UHG neck and the UHG neck showed this particular nodule which was uh, Bethesda 2. And we actually know that you can actually avoid surgery and you can be kept in follow up. But she was extremely apprehensive and also because of cosmetic reasons, she wanted the nodule to be removed. And therefore, we are going ahead with the thyroidectomy. The ultrasound neck of the opposite lobe is normal. So, there is no point doing a total thyroidectomy. Okay, so either you are able to see now? Yes, sir. So, you are. Uh, this is the medium space which we were sort of talking in the morning yes sir this is the medial space okay yes sir. this is the pedicle i met to see the uh no. okay sir so again you are going for the superior pole first yeah and, the uh, pole first uh, and then the rest because as you said in the lateral approach mm. the superior pole is much more easier uh, mm. to identify this is one of the branches of the uh, superior polar this vein. Yeah, I think the camera is slightly, okay. yeah, now it is better, much better. Oh, mosquito or uh, this. You are able to see that? Yes, sir. Very well. Very well seen. Huh? Yes, sir. Chaling. Chirin, sir. Now you are able to see? This is the pedicle. Oh, cause, dry cause. Yes, sir. We can see the 
superior laryngeal vessels now and we can clearly make out the division also yeah that is the anterior division this is the medial aspect you're able to see the nerve now yeah what well, your hand if you just put it a bit below we can see this yeah yeah definitely the hooking of the nerve ah, can be clearly made out yes sir yes ah? sir. excellent that is the no okay. that is a now yeah entry to the clicothorax here you are able to see the entry point there yes sir yeah that is yes sir very okay. good see yeah so you can actually take the entire picture now yeah uh, before the division itself since you have seen the now ah yes so huh? yes sir friend yes sir bye bye Hey, regular. Hey, yes, sir. previously people used to say that you have to ligate the artery and the vein independently and uh, it can still be done actually but there is no harm yeah, it was visible i yeah. did not attempt for it yeah yeah it is not basically there is no harm there is not likely yeah, yeah. to form a av fistula or something ah. these are all theoretical things right. so you can actually so now you can see actually the upper pole is fully detached small yeah. small soft tissue is left yes. otherwise we are clear of the nerve yes sir okay the nerve is here that is the nerve you are able to see that yes sir yes that sir. is the nerve yes yeah. it's clear of the nerve right so the entire uh, upper pole is delineated yeah right angle please right angle I think we can give artery forceps or something to hold the gland because your assistance is. So now you are dissecting the yeah nerve, sir. Looking for the mm. nerve. Yeah. So the, this is a left-sided thyroid nodule. So the nerve will be invariably in the tracheoesophageal groove. and uh, it is more likely that it is medial than lateral especially when you are dealing with left sided nerves because the nerve hooks around the arch of the aorta and comes primarily on the left side but is in the right side yeah. it hooks the subclavian vessels subclavian artery per se so most of the time uh, on the right side there is a tendency for it to be slightly lateral or away from the trachea whereas it's always almost oh, always uh in the tracheoesophageal groove when you are uh, doing it on the left side actually a, and it is quite medially located actually it.
this is the nodule that we are worried of here the white one hmm? doesn't look fine because it feels hard yes sir if any see the bethesda too <laughs> mm. yeah but there is some hemorrhagic areas i think it looks black and i think light can be little bit better this is the parathyroid here yeah i think light has to be adjusted a bit sir slightly light has to be adjusted yeah light has to be put into that cavity there okay oh it is here visible fine okay readjust uh, yeah you'll have to come inside here you have to come inside here i think the uh, yeah now it's better now it is fine yeah now it's yeah. much better sir yes right these are some small uh, branches here huh this yes, seems sir. to be the parathyroid here you are able to see it uh that retractor is coming in the way little bit that lower retractor yes the yeah. regulation yes yes now you are able to see the parathyroid yeah yeah now we are able to see sir. Yeah. yeah excellent that's the parathyroid that is the parathyroid we Must can be. kind of Must probably see the now no maybe not no now should be within this here yeah 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 i think that is now yeah. the so called toothpaste sign visible anybody knows what is a toothpaste sign or analog mark in the olden days there used to be colgate toothpaste no put it put it colgate used to come with closer right, also put it inside so there used to be one layer of white and one layer of red wait for a second it will so that is the so called toothpaste sign because the nerve is accompanied quite often by a vasa nervosum the nerve also has to have its own blood supply in fact most nerves in the body predominantly motor nerves they do have their own blood supply and that is known as a toothpaste sign so the nerve will be white in color and the accompanying vessel will be slightly red in Mosquito color please. so that would be the mosquito toothpaste sign also once you identify the nerve at least if you get a hazy picture of it you should not dissect lateral to it because that is where the blood supply is there as dr sridhar had said so you should not try and preserve the vaso nervosa of, of this nerve they are able to see the nerve now clearly yes yes sir very much very much we are able to see the nerve it is exactly in the tail groove Yeah, I think this angulation is very good. So we are able to see. Yeah, very well visible. Hmm? Yes. Now we are able to see. Yes, sir. Very much. No. Very much. Yes, sir. No. Hmm? One more thing you can see is that the nerve is closer to the midline here as yeah. compared to what yeah. you have seen in the morning. Doctor, because Arun, morning yeah. both the cases were on the right side, isn't it? Yes, sir. That's what we are explaining. Since it hooks around the arch of the aorta on the left side, it is almost invariably in the T groove. On the right side, because it goes around the subclavian, and the subclavian artery anatomy is sometimes there, and it can be more lateral actually. Most of the time, it is more lateral as it enters into the neck. Hooks around the subclavian and enters into the neck. Any experience with non-recurrent laryngeal nerve, Arvin sir? Ah, uh, yeah, I have done two cases. <laughs> one i had to uh, like i did not realize that uh, there was a vascular anomaly on table i realized it was this and i had to trace it back to prove uh, one i had anticipated and uh, it was a non recurrent recurrent laryngeal nerve it usually happens only when you have a subclavian coming out of uh, uh, this more on the right side when the subclavian for the left side comes from the descending branch of aorta Correct, yes, and it is usually on the right side. Yeah. So this is the nerve. I'm trying to trace the nerve. Hopefully, you are able to see it. Yes, sir. Very much. Right. Very much. Huh? You can see its blood supply also. Yeah. Yeah. Blood. Yeah. One second, please. Usually, these small bleeds happen more often than not. Uh -huh. These small tweaks of the inferior thyroid artery, slight pressure or bipolar usually controls them. Fine. 
mosquito please see here is the nerve are you able to see the nerve yes sir huh? yes sir very much right. you are nowhere near the nerve yes hmm. it's okay just keep it there for a bit doctor so almost done with the surgery i think just the inferior pole is remaining two branches of the inferior thyroid vein and we will be done right angle please Polar. Right angle now. this has the inferior thyroid vein here okay right one type please i think uh, tea and the biscuits are available for anybody who are willing for it i think surgery is very mesmerizing nobody wants to go out This has the inferior thyroid vein in it. I think your hand. Somebody can just release that hand. Yeah, yeah. Now it's visible. Sir. Yes. So, ah. That is fine. Okay. To hold the door pole up. Yeah. Bipolar, please. Once sir, I think the hand you can just move it a bit, yeah. Or somebody you can give it to somebody. That is better. Now, yeah, that right. is much better. Now, that is much okay. better. I think who are never you know. I think probably, yeah, he's, he's just uh, hold yeah. it. Hold it with an artery or something. Oh. What you can artery do? Artery, fancy. Must keep straight artery should be fine. Straight artery. Ah, yeah, fine. Right. We'll just put one in the capsule here, then you will be able to visualize better. No, fine. Sir, much better, much yeah. better. I'm not sure whether that is a parathyroid or not. The signs seem to be quite small for it. Yes, this sir. one. The other <laughs> one seems yeah. to be okay. This I'm not sure. Yes, There's no problem, sir. We have seen enough yeah. parathyroids today. <laughs> yeah. So this seems to be. For a hemi, I think especially uh, benign, but justified in going close to the yeah. gland and. Uh, Fine. Yes, sir. We have we have used we have used the trick here, and I think few fibers of the yeah berries are just remaining, and that will complete the reception. This vision is good. Yes, it is very nice, sir. 
okay yes sir excellent somebody is coming away now yeah okay i think here is where the spray is coming into play very nice ideally we have to be a little careful with the pottery here yeah here i think this few this which usually bleeds afterwards after you recite this tends to bleed here and yeah. you have a lot of trouble looking at and tends to be quite bad also actually marapal that is the stomas i'm yes, lifting yes. up the thigh right uh of the uh, trachea okay yes sir yes Hmm? This is the cricota, right? Yeah. Entry. Hmm? Yes, sir. So you have to go to the opposite thyroid isthmus junction. That is the because it is claimed that the that's it. That's seat of the other one. This is here. Yes, sir. Isthmus here. This yes, is sir. the other thyroid lobe here. Yes, sir. You are able to see that. Yeah, if your hand, right hand, if it comes down, you can see. Yeah, excellent. Yep. Yes, sir. Very much. Huh? So, yeah. the right side lower isthmal junction. Yeah. Isthmal lower junction is what we have to go for. And the reason is, it is claimed that the site of multi-member goiter and nerve formation is at the junction. Actually, we have to take both ipsilateral as well as contralateral lower isthmal junctions. And then you are ensuring that there is not going to be any recurrence. So you are dividing the isthmus. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us, sir? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sir. And as you know, I am using uh, spray. Uh, I am uh, not too bothered. Huh? Yes, sir. Is that? Yes, sir. Uh, this is the isthmus. This is the Lobe. Yes, sir. Excellent, excellent demonstrations. This is this is right, and this place looks bad. Yes, sir. I this place yeah. looks bad. Mm -hmm. So you will have to have a final histopathology to decide what to do. Yes, sir. You can approach it midline later if it turns out to be malignant because whatever we have done is a lateral approach. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sure. Huh? Excellent, sir. Thank you, sir. That align, please. I'll just show you the. Anatomy once, then can go. Anybody wants to know anything there, sir? You can just show all the landmarks, yeah, and also uh, what this lateral approach is, just as a gist. Yeah. The key is to first identify the sternocleidomastoid. Yeah. See, this is the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. This is the IJV. Basically, there is a branch. This is the main IJV. This is the branch. Okay, four steps. Ah, huh. one more retractor, please. Okay. Huh? This is the main IJV. This is the main IJV. This is a branch. They are not connected, ah. Huh? Sridhar, are you audible? No, Sridhar is coming up to the OT. Okay. okay. <laughs> right. Uh, this is the branch. Huh? This is yeah, it, is, it is visible. Can you uh, retract yeah. the lower retractor uh, keyboard? Ah, uh, the upper one a little bit more. Ah, uh, yeah. Huh? This is the main IJB. This is the branch. This is the main uh, IJB here. Just behind this, you are able to see the. Uh, when I try to talk this, you are able to see the pulsation here. This is carotid. Uh, you can keep the camera stable, cameraman. Yeah, we can see the carotid pulsation. Yeah, that is there. the carotid. Then. Sister, sister, take this. Take this. Take. This. Huh? this is the strap lateral edge. Right. Huh? This is the lateral strap here. Yeah. Mainly the omohyoid. If you see the omohyoid, omohyoid is crossing somewhere here. I have not divided the omohyoid. See that? Hold. Yes. This is the omohyoid. Yes. Okay. Omohyoid invariably will cross over the IJV. So you don't have to worry. You will know. That omohyoid will cross over the IJV. This is the omohyoid. The other two straps will be medial to this. Okay, this is the omohyoid. This is the other two straps here. Edge. We are able to make out here. Yes, clearly. Yeah. Uh, these two. Okay. 
that is for the anatomy drug for the thyroid bed as well yeah like this yeah this is the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve here this is the recurrent laryngeal nerve here see yeah it is visible can you yeah. focus better bipolar yeah it is visible sign Uh, this is the recurrent laryngeal now you see it is sitting on the esophagus this is esophagus correct so on this the left esophagus. side you can see the esophagus yeah. also that is the esophagus on the right side is not so visible when you are doing a thyroidectomy uh, this is the superior laryngeal nerve here able to make up the camera angle has to be changed here. Be gentle, be gentle. Don't pull. Yeah. You have to come down about this side. You have to come here. Oh. Not done. Done. Oh, yeah. Come here, come here, lower end. Focus this. Focus. Out. Okay. This is this is the superior laryngeal now. Able to see it? Yeah, it is visible there. and i can we can see the ligated superior pole also yeah, yeah. here is the superior laryngeal the rest all the same nothing much so this is the parathyroid that we have left behind here this one this one fine cos cos this is the parathyroid here left behind yes that should be it okay. so that was really an excellent demonstration dr arvin right. right. especially the lateral door approach or yeah. the unconventional approach what we do for uh, thyroidectomy so i just wanted to ask in your practice how often do you do this approach i usually do it only for uh, uh, completion thyroidectomy i never attempted for a primary case i usually attempt it for uh, completion thyroidectomies which is true in this case for demonstration we have done yeah. it uh not very frequent like only when the patient comes back for a completion thyroidectomy i do a lot of closure also yeah they want to see the closure also so because last two cases we have right. not see right. so couple right. of questions how what layer do you close the plasma uh i close the plasma i use a single uh, uh monocle stitch monocle 30 okay single monocle for everything okay so yeah. i Ah, uh, I tend to take everything continuous, and I tend to put a drain also, small drain. So, couple of questions during closure uh, yeah. regarding drain. approximation of the strap muscles. Okay. So, some surgeons usually regularly approximate it, some leave it alone. I take a single stitch from the strap muscle. I take three stitches, uh, named ones, so that I can have gaps in between. I want actually the uh, cavity between to be continuous with it. which is true that is what uh -huh. i do so uh -huh. intermittent vicral uh, loose stitches on the muscle if yeah. i open it in the midline yeah even so, because this is lateral i don't think whether you should do it or not do it but i usually put a loose stitch because i use a monocle that doesn't stay for long just to have the orientation in the center can that drain be adjusted it is obstructing yeah. the field Fine, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, just waiting for the drain. Once I usually tend to put it on the opposite side and to towards the same side. I usually put it at uh, here, and I take the tip inside it, and I usually uh, put the drain. 
do you routinely put drains for all thyroidectomy i always do. somehow i am not comfortable because uh, i go home so uh, i am not really the mood to come back if there is any emergency <laughs> okay i have never tried it without the drain that is the yes. regardless of it hemostasis has to be absolute yeah. before we close yeah no confusion about drain. that and uh, i am comfortable when i put a drain that is the only reason i go ahead putting tooth uh, process give me that uh, remaining uh, drain that is enough don't take me one ah tooth for subs i usually take here only i don't do a separate one i usually take through the uh, 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 skin fold that is see on one side usually one side would be longer than the other side i take the place where it is shorter this is another thing uh, once you put the drain where do you put it do you put it on top of the strap no, i uh, i put it inside and outside both both okay. both so hold it straight up hold it straight up hold this straight up no no leave this now hold that straight up So these practices usually change depending on the hospital and certain yeah. preferences. So there is nothing How right now. Because I was used to working alone initially. Now only I have a PG program going on. So I used to be very particular that I put a drain and go. I still follow that, and I think even as newcomers we should follow until you are very sure that it doesn't bleed. And I usually tend to send them to the post-operative ward. I do usually don't take them to the ICU for a day. Uh, because i send them to the post operative ward i tend to uh, drain and uh, leave it there okay fine monocle stitch please so this is how uh, this is how my drain is placed i don't cut the drain usually or uh, some people are very apprehensive whether the tip of the drain is going to touch the now so Be aware; it is good not to go near the nerve when you place your drains. One stitch. This is the sternomastoid lateral border, and this is the uh, strap puzzle. That is uh, the omohyoid single stitch here. Another thing that I have noticed is sometimes these drains help in helping your flap stick better. Yeah. So even though you are very sure of hemostasis, if it is a large tumor and the skin is very lax, uh, uh, there definitely tends to be some some amount of serum or fluid that is going to collect in the cavity, and usually the flaps take a longer time to heal if there is no drain. Cut this, all this. One one limb you cut. So what is the BP like before closure now? Uh, it's reading. One second. So usually, if your anesthetist has given a hypotensive anesthesia, you also I don't it. really expect a night of hypotensive anesthesia routinely. <laughs> Not for thyroid specifically. Huge ones, I specifically asked for it. small ones i don't bother to go for a hypotensive anesthesia there really is not that much evidence if it really helps or no, no. so so i actually take the platysma this is the platysma opposite side some people believe in putting only intermittent sutures at this level i put loose continuous so any form of observable suture should do yeah uh, vicryl or monocryl is also yeah. fine i tend to use monocryl at uh, all for all my head and neck cases because i'm used to it but anything should do no problem
I think it's also important that you identify the platysma and then stitch only that. Because yeah. if you take it in the subcutaneous plane, sometimes they'll be puckering. Yeah. So don't take it too thick. Just hold the platysma and then take it. Yeah. Out. Don't pull, just don't pull. Leave it loose. Leave it loose. Leave it. Some people believe in doing this intermittently because they feel if they do intermittent, there is a chance that uh, uh, you will be, uh, uh, it will not, one, it will not give way, second, there will be no, uh, if there is any bleeding inside, it will come out. But I don't find much difference here, so I don't do it intermittent, I usually do it continuous. Hudson, please. Just put the suction into that. That's it. And this layer goes subcritical. There are a lot of seniors also in the audience, so if there is any different practices over in your experience or any inputs, please feel free to tell us. So when do you usually remove the drains, Dr. Arvind? One second. Can you hear me? Warren, can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, it is audible. Yeah, yeah, come. So just... I remove it when it is around 30 ml. Okay. 30 ml, I remove uh, the drains. I usually wait up till 30 ml. I don't hurry on it. We usually put a Roma back drain, yeah, which is a suction drain. Yeah, suction number drain. 14 I or 16 put a 16 should be routinely today because it is a hemi and a small one i have uh, restored to 14 14 i smaller one 16, 16 both for this breast everything single i use smaller ones tend to get clotted yeah easily, i'm so not probably. happy with them 
and I don't put a dressing. After finishing, I just put an ointment and leave the patient like that. Correct. We don't usually put a pressure dressing as well. Ah, so I don't not... put anything because I think that is very important that uh, uh, in the post-operative period, you look at the neck whether it is swelled or not. So usually we ask the resident or whoever is going to stay for the night to have a look at the neck as soon as we finish and uh, we follow it up. So next day, if there is anything different from that is what we are worried. Correct. That is a very important point. Over to you, Dr. Sridhar. So we have come to the end of our uh, session, our first head and neck uh, oncology workshop. Uh, I hope uh, the audience had uh, a good interactive session with our faculty members, uh, were able to see and experience our uh, institution. And I have to give uh, sincere thanks for all the faculty members, uh, Dr. Arvind, Dr. Karthik, Dr. Rajgaru, uh, who have left. They are all extremely busy practitioners. Uh, some of them, as Dr. Arvind himself has said, he is the, uh, he, he runs a, a surgical oncology program at MS Rami and he has taken time from his busy schedule to come and uh, you know spend time at our institute. We are extremely grateful for him. And um, also, last but not least, all the delegates for coming here on a Sunday. Uh, we had close to 313 uh, registrations, a large extremely uh, good outpouring of uh, interest and uh, almost 115 uh, have turned up which uh, which we are extremely grateful for and uh, last but not the least dr varun who has been with me for the past one year and uh, for, and you know we are having a lot of we are able to do a lot of complex surgeries dr nagarjuna who has been with me for almost one and a half years now um, i am quite tough on him sometimes but you know uh, he is an extremely sincere person all the nursing staff uh, who have been with this institute from its inception since 2018, the anesthesiology colleagues, Dr. Sunil sir, who has who is gone, Dr. Madam, and uh, including the audio, audio vision staff, Mohan and his entire team, Shiva, Ganesh, for uh, making it, I think, was quite a seamless uh, presentation of uh, our head and neck surgery workshop. And last but not the least, our marketing team, who have moved heaven and earth for the past 20 days, starting with uh, John, uh, Sanjay, uh, Niladri, Partha, all of them have done, and including the branding team, Dhanlakshmi. I hope I have not skipped anybody's name, and if I have, I, I sincerely apologize. And uh, I would like to uh, say extremely, extremely thank, thanking you all for making this a very good and a nice event. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.